Random House Audiobooks presents Dragonlance Legends Volume 3 Test of the Twins by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman Read for you by Peter McNichol Nothing living stirred. In the wake of the great explosion, there was nothing left of the plains of Durgoth at all. Both dwarven armies had been completely wiped out. Not even the corpses remained. Even the very face of the land itself had changed. Karas, the dwarven hero, looked down from his vantage point in the foothills of the Corollis Mountains. He looked to where the magical fortress of Zaman had once stood. It, too, had been destroyed, but not totally. The fortress had collapsed in upon itself, and now, most horribly, its ruins resembled a human skull sitting on the plain of death, grinning. Rio, father, forger, forgive us, Karis murmured. Then, his head bowed in grief, he left the site, returning to Thorbarden, the underground home of the mountain dwarves. The dwarves would believe, for so Karas himself would report, that the destruction of both armies on the plains of Durgoth was brought about by Reorks, that the god had, in his anger, hurled his hammer down upon the land, smiting his children. But the chronicles of Astinus tell the real story. Astinus, the ageless, deathless chronicler of Krinish history, recorded the true ending of the Dwarf Gate War. Now, at the height of his magical powers, the archmage Raislin, known also as Fiston Dantilus, and the white-robed cleric of Paladine, Crescenia, sought entry into the portal that leads to the abyss, there to challenge and fight the Queen of Darkness. Dark crimes of his own this archmage had committed to reach this point, the pinnacle of his ambition. The black robes he wore were stained with blood, some of it his own. As for Lady Crescenia, the revered daughter of the church, she possessed one fatal flaw in the white marble of her soul, and that flaw Raceland found and widened, so that the crack would spread throughout her being and eventually reach her heart. Crescenia followed him to the dread portal. Here she called upon her god, and Paladine answered, for truly she was his chosen. Raceland called upon his magic, and he was successful for no wizard had yet lived as powerful as he. The portal opened. Raceland started to enter, but a magical time-traveling device, being operated by the mage's twin brother, Karamon, and the kender, Tasselhoff Burfoot, interfered with the archmage's spell. The field of magic was disrupted with disastrous and unforeseen consequences. said Tesselhoff Burfoot. Caramon fixed the kender with a stern eye. It's not my fault. Really, Caramon. One minute, Tass and Caramon had been standing in the magical fortress of Zaman, activating the magical time-traveling device. The next minute, Raceland had begun working his magic. And, before Tass knew it, there had been a terrible commotion. Stones singing and rocks cracking, and a horrible feeling of being pulled in six different directions at once, and then, whoosh, here they were. Wherever here was, he and Caramon were on a mountain trail, standing ankle-deep in ash-gray mud. In every direction, there was nothing but complete and total devastation. Above them, the sky was gray and empty. To the west, however, it was a strange violet color, boiling with weird luminous clouds laced with lightning of brilliant blue. Other than the distant rumble of thunder, there was no sound, no movement nothing. Karamon rubbed his hand across his face. His sweaty skin was coated with a fine film of gray ash. Where are we, Tess? Uh, I'm sure I haven't any idea, Karamon. Have you? I, I thought of where I wanted to go. Home, to solace, 
just like I was supposed to do. I was thinking of solace too, Caramon. Caramon's face creased in puzzlement. This place certainly looks strange. But it seems familiar somehow. You're right. It does remind me of somewhere. Now that you mention it. Only I don't recall ever having been any place quite this awful. Except the abyss. A hot wind sprang up, and a fine rain began to fall, mingling with the ash drifting through the air. Tass was just about to comment on the slimy quality of the rain, when suddenly, without warning, the world blew up. At least that was Tass's first impression. Brilliant, blinding light, a boom that shook the ground, and Tasselhoff found himself sitting in the mud, staring at a gigantic hole that had been blasted in the rock not a hundred feet away from him. Caramon reached down and dragged Tass to his feet. Name of the gods, Tass, are you all right? I, I, I think so. As Tass watched, lightning streaked again from the cloud to ground, sending rock and ash hurtling through the air. My, that certainly was an interesting experience, th though nothing I'd care to repeat right away. The sky was growing darker by the minute. We'd better get off this high ground, Tass. At least as a trail, it must lead somewhere. As they labored down the hillside, they entered what must once have been, Tass imagined, a beautiful valley. At one time, he guessed, the trees here must have been ablaze with autumn oranges and golds. Tass decided to try an old kinder trick, to use when lost. Closing his eyes and blotting everything from his mind, he ordered his brain to provide him with a picture of the landscape before him. A picture came to him, so vivid clear that he was rather startled. Giant trees, mountains on the horizon, a lake. Opening his eyes, Tass gasped. There was a lake. He hadn't noticed it before, probably because it was the same gray color as the ash-covered ground. Was there water there still, or was it filled with mud? The hot wind blew about them, sending Tass's top knot of hair streaming out from his head like a banner and whipping Karaman's cloak out. The big warrior was staring at the lake, the same lake Tass had noticed. Karaman's face was pale, his eyes troubled. After a moment, he began walking again, trudging grimly down the trail. Tass squished along after him. They had reached the valley floor. Karaman had begun to limp again from when he'd fallen and wrenched his knee back in the magical fortress of Zaman. There was a look on his face that made Tass feel all prickly inside. A look of true fear. What's the matter, Caramon? Be quiet, Tass. Caramon stared around him, his eyes wide. Tass clapped his hands over his mouth to bottle up the words, determined to keep quiet if it killed him. He had a strange quaking feeling inside. He looked at the stumps of the burned trees more closely. Even burned, they were huge. Easily the largest trees he had ever seen in his life, except for... Tass gulped. Leaves. Autumn colors. The smoke of cooking fires curling up from the valley. The lake, blue and smooth as crystal. Blinking, he rubbed his eyes to clear them of the gummy film of mud and rain. He stared around him, looking back up at the trail, at that huge boulder. He stared at the lake that he could see quite clearly through the burned tree stumps. Oh, Caravan! Those are Valenwood trees! I know, Tess. This is solace. Come on, Tess. Let's go find out what's happened. They came to a bend in the road. Each recognized it, though neither said anything. Once, travelers coming around that bend would have seen the inn of the last home, gleaming with light. They would have smelled Otik's spiced potatoes, heard the sounds of laughter and song drifting from the door. But there was only silence. And, far off in the distance, the continuous rumble of thunder... Finally, Karaman sighed and limped forward. Let's go. Tess followed more slowly, his heart heavy. Over and over, he muttered to himself, This isn't solace. This isn't solace. This isn't solace. Until it began to sound like one of Raceland's magical incantations. The big man's injured knee suddenly gave way. He staggered and would have fallen if Tass hadn't propped him up. With Tass's help, Caramon made his way over to the stump of what had been an unusually large Valenwood. Leaning against it, his face pale with pain and dripping with sweat, Caramon rubbed his injured knee. 
What can I do to help Caramon? Oh, I know. I'll find you a crutch. There must be lots of broken branches lying about. I'll go look. Caramon said nothing, only nodded wearily. Tass dashed off, rather glad to have something to do. He soon found what he was looking for, the end of a tree branch sticking up through the mud. Catching hold of it, the kender gave it a yank. His hand slipped off the wet branch, sending him toppling over backward. Getting up, he grimly took hold of the branch again. This time, he felt it give a little. I've almost got it, Caramon. I. <coughs> a most unkender-like shriek rose above the screaming wind. Caramon limped over in alarm. Tass was crawling up out of a large sinkhole he'd fallen into. The kender's face was like nothing Caramon had ever seen. It was ashen and white. The eyes staring. Oh, don't come any closer, Caramon! Please stay back. But it was too late. Caramon had reached the edge of the hole and was staring down. Tass began to shake and sob. They're all dead, all dead. Burying his face in his arms, the kender wept bitterly. At the bottom of the hole lay piles of bodies, men, women, children. Some were still pitifully recognizable. Gritting his teeth, the big warrior forced himself. To look into that grave, forced himself to look for a mass of red curls. He turned away with a shuddering sob of relief. Then he began to limp back toward where the inn would have been. Take a. Tess sprang up. Caramon. He slipped in the mud and fell. Take a. Oblivious to the pain of his injured leg, Caramon staggered down a wide, clear area free of tree stumps. The road leading past the inn. Tess's mind registered. Caramon was heading toward the place where his house had been. His fear and hope giving him strength. Tass soon lost sight of Caramon amid the blackened stumps, but he could hear his voice still calling his wife's name. With a sigh, Tass trudged off after him. At the very end of the street, in what had once been a small park, Tass came upon a stone obelisk. It hadn't been there the last time he'd been in solace. He realized, examining it, tall, crudely carved, it had nevertheless. Survived the ravages of fire and wind and storm. Its surface was charred, but there were letters carved into it. Tass brushed away the soot and mud covering the stone. Caramon. The odd note in the kender's voice penetrated Caramon's haze of grief. He lifted his head, seeing the strange obelisk. The big man painfully limped toward it. What is it? Tass could only point. Caramon came around to the front and stood. Silently reading the unfinished inscription. Hero of the Lance, Tika Waylon Majere, death year, three fifty eight. Your life's tree felled too soon. I fear, lest in my hands the axe be found. I'm sorry, Caramon. Tas slipped his hand into the big man's limp, nerveless fingers. Caramon's head bowed. Putting his hand on the obelisk, he stroked its cold, wet surface as the wind whipped around them. She died alone, he said. Doubling his fist, he bashed it into the rock, cutting his flesh on the sharp edges. I left her alone. I should have been here. Damn it! I should have been here. His shoulders began to heave with sobs. I don't think you could have done anything, Caramon, even if you had been here. Suddenly. Tass withdrew his hand from Caramon's and knelt down in the mud. The kender's quick eyes had caught sight of something shining in the sickly rays of the pale sun. Reaching down with a trembling hand, Tass hurriedly scooped away the muck. Name of the gods, Caramon, you were here. What? Caramon turned and looked down. There, at his feet, lay his own corpse. <laughs> At least it appeared to be Caramon's corpse. It was wearing the very armor he was wearing now. There was no sign of what had killed him. What's going on, Caramon? If that's you and you're dead, how, how can you be here at the same time? Oh no! What if you're not here? If you're not here, then I've made you up. Oh my! I never knew I had such a vivid imagination. You certainly look real. Reaching out a trembling hand, he touched Caramon. You feel real, and if you don't mind my saying so, you even smell real. Oh, Caramon, I must be going crazy. No, Tess, this is real, all too real. 
Caramon stared at the corpse, then at the obelisk that was now barely visible in the rapidly fading light. And it's starting to make sense. If only I could... He paused, staring intently at the obelisk. That's it. Tass, look at the date on the monument. 358. 358? Caramon, it was 356 when we left Solace. We've come too far, Tass. We've come into our own future. Caramon wondered how the world had become this wasteland in a mere two years. It must, he realized, have been a result of the battle for supremacy between his brother Raislin, the greatest magic user the world had ever known, and the mage's goddess, the Dark Queen, Takesis. But who was winning, Caramon asked himself. He suddenly felt sick and dizzy. What did it mean? What was he doing here? How could he be dead and alive at the same time? Was that even his corpse? Since Tass had altered time, it could be someone else. But, most importantly, what had happened to Solace? Did Raislin cause this? Caramon muttered to himself. Does this have something to do with him? Did this happen because he failed or... or... Oh, please let it be a dream, Caramon prayed lowering his head to his knees and feeling bitter tears creep beneath his closed eyelids. He sat there, no longer even affected by the storm, crushed by the weight of his sudden understanding. The dream he walked in was a waking dream, a waking nightmare. He needed only one thing to confirm the knowledge that he knew in his heart needed no confirmation. The storm passed gradually, moving on to the south. Caramon could literally feel it go the thunder walking the land like the feet of giants. The sky would be clear now, till the next storm. He would see the moons, the stars. The stars. He had only to look up into the clear sky and he would know. With a small sigh, Caramon raised his head and looked up into the heavens. There it was, the confirmation of his fears, the sealing of his doom. A new constellation in the sky. An hourglass. What does it mean? Asked Tass, staring up at the stars. It means Raceland succeeded. It means he entered the abyss and challenged the Queen of Darkness and... defeated her. Oh, not defeated her, Caramon. There's her constellation. But it's in the wrong place. It's over there when it should be over here. And there's Paladine. I wonder if he had to fight Raislin. Raislin won, Tess. He's what he wanted to be. A god. And now he rules over a dead world. Dead world? Do do, do you mean that the whole world's like this? Everything on Kryn? Palanthus? Kendamore? Everything? Look around, Tess. What do you think? Have you seen any other living beings since we've been here? You watch the fire sweep the mountainside. I can see the lightning now on the horizon. Another storm coming. Nothing can live through this, Tess. We'll be dead ourselves before long. Are we just going to die here then, Caramon? Because if we are, I really think I'd like to go over and lie down next to Tika, if you don't mind. It it would make me feel more at home. Sighing, he rested his head against Caramon's strong arm. It would be easy to die, Caramon said more to himself than to Taz. It would be easy to lie down. Let the darkness take me. Then, gritting his teeth, he staggered to his feet. That's funny, he added, as he drew his sword and began to hack a branch off the fallen Valenwood they had been using as shelter. Raised asked me that once. Would you follow me into darkness, he said. What are you doing, Caramon? You're making a crutch. Tass jumped to his feet in sudden alarm. Caramon, you can't be thinking that. That, 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 that. That's crazy. I remember when Raceland asked you that question, and I remember his answer when you told him yes. He said it would be the death of you, Caramon. As strong as you are, it would kill you. Caramon did not reply. Wet wood flew as he sawed at the tree branch. Occasionally, he glanced behind him at the new storm clouds that were approaching. Caramon, Tass grabbed the big man's arm. Even if you went there, what would you do? Something I should have done a long time ago. You're going after him, aren't you? 
Taz scrambled out of the hole. That's crazy, just crazy. You don't even know where you're going. You, you, you don't know where he is. I have a way to get there. Caramon put his sword back in its sheath. Lend me your knife, Tess. The kender handed it over with a sigh as Caramon trimmed the branch he'd cut. I have the magical device. As for where there is, you know that. The... the abyss? A dull boom of thunder made them both look apprehensively at the approaching storm. Then Caramon returned to his work with renewed vigor. Let's see if this crutch I've made works before another storm hits. We'll walk over to Tika's... to the obelisk. The warrior leaned his weight on the crutch experimentally. It sank into the mud several inches. Caramon yanked it out and took another step. Slowly, they inched their way across the slimy ground. Maybe that device can't get me into the abyss, but I know someone who can. The device will take us to him. Who? Boss Alien. He'll be able to send me wherever I need to go. Caramon and Tass used the magical device to take them to Weyrith Forest. There, too, the storm was raging. At the edge of the forest, they found the corpse of Bupu, the gully dwarf Raistlin had once befriended. They found an emerald in her palm, the emerald she'd once given the mage. Raistlin must still have a soft spot in his heart for Bupu, they realized, as they entered the magical wood. The magical forest stood, but something was definitely wrong with it. The magic had gotten out of control. Something must be dreadfully wrong inside the tower. Just then the trees grabbed them both and would have strangled them if Caraman hadn't shouted his name and called upon the protection of Parsalian. The trees let go of Caraman and Tass and formed an avenue leading toward the tower. As they approached, Caraman and Tass heard screaming. But when they got closer, they saw that it was only the front gate swinging wildly on its rusty hinges. For centuries, the Tower of High Sorcery at Weyrith had stood, a bastion of magic, the repository of the books and artifacts of the art, collected over the years. Here the mages had come when they were driven from Palanthus by the King Priest. Here they brought their most valued objects. Here they dwelt in peace, guarded by the forest of Weyrith. Apprentice magic users took the test here, the grueling test that meant death to those who failed. Here, Raceland had lost his soul to Fist and Dandalus. Here, Caramon and Taz had returned with the gully dwarf, Boo-Poo, bearing the comatose body of Lady Crisania. Here, they had learned Raceland's ambition to challenge the Queen of Darkness. Here, they had met his apprentice and spy, Dalimar. Here, the great archmage Parsalian had cast a time travel spell on Caramon and Lady Crisania, sending them back to Istar before the mountain fell. Here, Tasselhoff had inadvertently upset the spell by jumping in to go with Caramon. Thus, the presence of the Kender, forbidden by all the laws of magic, allowed time to be altered. Now Caramon and Tass had returned. To find what? Caramon stared at the tower, his heart heavy with dread. He stepped forward, his brow creased in a frown. Suddenly, a scream split the air, shattering the darkness. Only this time, it wasn't the gate. There were words in this scream, words that could be heard, if not defined. The scream was coming from the tower. End it! Parsalian screamed. End this torment! How much did you force me to endure, O oh, great one of the white robes? Came a soft, sneering voice into Parsalian's mind. You brought me here and gave me up to Fist and Dantilus? You sat and watched as he wrenched the life force from me, draining it so that he might live upon this plane. It was you who made the bargain, Raceland. You could have refused. And died honorably. I wanted to live, and I did live. And you, in your bitterness, gave me these hourglass eyes that saw nothing but decay and death all around me. Now you look, Parsalian. What do you see around you? Nothing but death. So, we are even. 
and in your last tortured moments, Parsalian, you will witness my triumph. Already my constellation shines in the sky. The queen dwindles. Soon she will fade and be gone forever. My final foe, Paladine, waits for me now. But he is no challenge. An old man, filled with sorrow. He is hurt beyond healing, as was Crisania, his poor cleric, who died upon the shifting plains of the abyss. You will watch me destroy him, Parsalian. And when that battle is ended, when you have paid homage to the new and only god, to me, then you will be released in death. Parsalian was still a living man, from the waist up. From the waist down, he was a marble pillar. Cursed by Raislin, the white-robed wizard was being forced to stand still in the topmost room of his tower and watch the end of the world. Estinus of Palanthus, chronicler of the world, sat next to Parsalian, recording the last chapter of Crin's brief shining history. He sat before the great portal in the Tower of High Sorcery, staring into the portal's shadowy depths. Estinus had come to this, the last place standing upon Crin, to witness and record the world's final, terrifying hours. When all was finished, he would take the closed book and lay it upon the altar of Gillian, god of neutrality. And that would be the end. Sensing the black-robed figure within the portal, turning its gaze upon him, Astinus raised his eyes to meet Raceland's. Astinus, so shall you be last. When you have recorded my ultimate victory, the book will be closed. I will rule unchallenged. True, you will rule unchallenged. You will rule a dead world. And you will be alone, alone in the formless, eternal void. Astinus watched the black robe's figure's hands clench. That is a lie, old friend. I will create new worlds, new peoples I will produce, new races who will worship me. Evil cannot create. It can only destroy. It turns in upon itself, gnawing itself. Already you feel it eating away at you, Raislin. Easy will it be for us to slip back into our dreamless sleep. For you, Raislin, there will be no sleep, only an endless waking, endless listening for sounds that will never come, endless shrieking words that no one will hear. And you will continue to exist forever within this emptiness. The portal shimmered. Astinus looked through it and saw a soul, frightened, alone, caught in its own trap, seeking escape. For the first time in his existence, compassion touched Astinus. His hand marking his place in his book, he half rose from his seat, his other hand reaching into the portal. Then, laughter. Eerie, mocking, bitter laughter. The black-robed figure within the portal was gone. With a sigh, Estinus resumed his seat, and almost at the same instant, magical lightning flickered inside the portal. It was answered by flaring white light, the final meeting of Paladine, and the young man who had defeated the Queen of Darkness and taken her place. Lightning flickered outside, too, stabbing the eyes of the two men watching with blinding brilliance. Thunder crashed. The stones of the tower trembled. Lifting a drawn, haggard face, Parsalian twisted his head to stare out the windows with an expression of horror. This is the end. The end of all things. Yes, said Astinus, frowning in annoyance as a sudden lurching of the tower caused him to make an error. He gripped his book more firmly, his eyes on the portal, writing, recording the last battle as it occurred. Within a matter of moments, all was over. The white light flickered briefly, then died. Parsalian wept as the tower shook, ignoring the falling stones and heaving rocks. Astinus coolly penned the final words. As of fourth day, fifth month, year 358, the world ends. Astinus started to close the book, but a hand slammed down across the pages. No, said a firm voice. It will not end here. A 
Stylus dropped a blot of ink upon the paper, obliterating the last words. Caramon! Caramon Marger! Parsalian cried, reaching out with feeble hands. Then it was you I heard in the forest! I doubted my own sanity! How can you be here? How could you have survived the magical battles that destroyed the world? He didn't, Stylus said sternly. Having regained his composure, he placed the open book down on the floor at his feet and stood up. Glowering at Caramon, he pointed an accusing finger. What trick is this? You died! Without speaking a word, Caramon dragged Tasselhoff out from behind him. Deeply impressed by the solemnity of the occasion, Tass huddled next to Caramon, his wide eyes fixed upon Parsalian with a pleading gaze. Do you want me to explain, Caramon? Oh, um, I, I, I really feel I should tell why I disrupted the time travel spell. And then there's how Raceland gave me the wrong instructions and made me break the magical device, and how I ended up in the abyss. All this is known to me, the Steinus interrupted. So you were able to come here because of the Kender. Our time is short. What is it you intend, Caramon Majer? The big man turned his gaze to Parsalian. I have the magical device. I can travel back to any point in time. Tell me when. Tell me what happened that led to this destruction, and I will undertake to prevent it if I can. Caramon's gaze went from Parsalian to Astinus. The historian shook his head. Do not look at me, Caramon Majer. I am neutral in this, as in all things. I can only give you this warning. You may go back, but you may find you change nothing. A pebble in a swiftly flowing river, that is all you may be. Kiramon nodded. Then at least I will die knowing I tried to make up for my failure. Astinus regarded Kiramon with a keen glance. What failure is that you speak of, warrior? You risked your life going back after your brother. You endeavored to convince him that this path of darkness he walked would lead only to his own doom. Wherein did you fail? Germon drew a shaking breath. When he stood before the portal, telling me what he intended, I left him. I simply turned my back and walked away. I could have followed him into darkness to show him that I was willing to sacrifice for love, what he was willing to sacrifice for his magic. Then he might have listened. And so I will go back. I will enter the abyss. And there I will do what must be done. What must be done? Parsalian repeated feverishly. You do not realize what that means. Dalamar! A blazing, blinding bolt of lightning exploded within the room. No one could see or hear anything as the thunder crashed over them. Then, above the blast of thunder, rose a tortured cry. Shaken by the pain-filled scream, Karaman opened his eyes, only to wish they had been shut forever before seeing such a grisly sight. Parsalian had turned from a pillar of marble to a pillar of flame. Caught in Raceland's spell, the wizard could do nothing but scream as the flame slowly crept up his immobile body. Tasselhoff covered his face with his hands and cowered, whimpering in a corner. Astinus rose from where he had been hurled to the floor, his hands going immediately to the book he still held. He started to write, but his hand fell limp. The pen slipped from his fingers. Once more, he began to close the cover. No! Caramon cried. Reaching out, he laid his hands upon the pages. Astinus looked at him, and Caramon faltered beneath the gaze of those deathless eyes. His hands shook, but they remained pressed firmly across the pages. Astinus released the open book. Hold this, Caramon ordered, closing the precious volume and thrusting it into Tasselhoff's hands. The Kender wrapped his arms around the book, which was almost as big as he was, and remained crouched in his corner. Caramon lurched across the room toward the dying wizard. No! Do not come near me! Parsalian's skin bubbled and sizzled, the terrible clawing stench of burning flesh mingled with the smell of sulfur. Tell me, Parsalian, cried Caramon, getting as near as he could. What must I do? How can I prevent this? The wizard's eyes were melting, his mouth was a gaping hole, but his dying words struck Caramon like a bolt of lightning to be burned into his mind forever. Raceland must not be allowed to leave the abyss!
Two years earlier, in the year 356, the year Caramon and Tass had left Solus to go back in time in the company of Lady Crisania, the undead Solamnic knight Lord Soth sat on the battlements of the ruined castle of Dargard Keep, staring out into the distance, thinking of his liege lady and companion in evil, the dragon high lord Kitiara. The undead cannot feel lust, but Soth had become obsessed by Kitiara nevertheless. Her beauty, her courage, her ambition, her cruelty, her sheer evil. Floating in the shadows of her bedroom, he had seen her in the arms of many men. For a long time it was Tannis Half-Elven who had dominated her longings. Now the Half-Elf commanded the garrison of Salanthus, facing Kitiara as general of an opposing army. Kitiara's spies had brought her some of Tannis's military dispatches, and she had shed tears reading them as if they were love notes. She still loved Tannis, and this made Soth furious. He was even angrier about Dalamar, the apprentice of Caramon's, and Kitiara's brother raced them. The black-robed dark elf was Kitiara's latest flame, and he now dominated her thoughts the way Tannis once had. Soth thought briefly of killing Dalamar. The dark elf had learned his magic well, but he was no match for a death knight like Soth, who could kill with a whispered word. Soth vowed to himself that in the end he alone would possess Kitiara, and when he did, he would possess her forever. The carriage rumbled to a stop, and a head poked in the carriage window. Morning, sir. Welcome to Palanthus. Please state your name and business. Good morning. My name is Tannis Half-Elven, and I'm here by invitation to see revered son Elistan. I've got a letter here. Lord Tannis! I beg your pardon, sir. I I, I, I didn't recognize. That is, uh, I, I couldn't see, or I'm sure I would have recognized. Damn it, man. Don't apologize for doing your job. Here's the letter. Oh, dreadfully sorry, sir. The letter won't be necessary, sir. They're... Grinning to himself, but a rueful grin at that, Tannis leaned back as the carriage continued on its way. The guard was his idea. It had taken a great deal of persuasion on Tannis's part to convince Lord Amathus of Palanthus that the city gate should not only be shut, but actually guarded as well. Tannis sighed. When would they learn? The whole continent of Ancelon seemed to have fallen into complacency since the end of the War of the Lance two years ago. War's end day was coming up, with its parades and foolishness. He and all the other heroes of the Lance would be heading parades in various places. His own wife, Lorana, was in Sylvanesti, the ancient elven homeland, to head the parade there. After the funeral of Lorana's father, Tannis and Lorana had stopped in solace on their way home to see what had become of Lady Crisania. But Tika knew nothing of her whereabouts, nor of Caramon and Tass's. Tannis looked down at the letter in his hands and read it once more. Tannis, half-elven, we must meet with you immediately. Gravest emergency. The Temple of Paladine. After watch, rising, twelve. Fourth day, year 356. That was all. No signature. Tannis tucked the letter back inside his pouch. His gaze went unwillingly to the Tower of High Sorcery. I'll wager it has to do with you, Raislin, he murmured thinking of the strange disappearance of Lady Crisania. The door flew open. The footman fumbled with the step that folded down from the floor. Oh, forget that, Tannis snapped impatiently, hopping to the ground. Ignoring the footman's faint look of outraged sensibility, Tannis drew in a deep breath, glad to have escaped finally from the stuffy confines of the carriage. He gazed around, letting the wonderful feeling of peace and well-being that radiated from the Temple of Paladine seep into his soul. Gardens of bright-colored flowers delighted the eye, their perfume filling the air with sweetness. Fountains poured forth pure, cool water as white-robed clerics walked in the gardens, their heads bent together in solemn discussion. There were gates, but no guards. All were invited to enter, and many did so. It was a haven for the weary, the unhappy. Tennis saw many people sitting upon the grass, a look of peace upon faces that, from the marks of care and weariness, had not often known such comfort. Suddenly, a figure emerged from the shadows of a grove of aspens that stood at the very edge of the temple property. Tannis half elven. As the figure walked into the light, Tannis started. It was dressed in black robes. Numerous pouches and other spell-casting devices hung from its belt. Raceland, Tannis thought instantly, but no. Tannis breathed easier. This magic user was well-formed, muscular, his step youthful and vigorous and the man had spoken with an elven accent. I'm Tannis Half-Elven. 
I thought I recognized you. You may dismiss your carriage. It will not be needed. You will be spending many days, possibly even weeks, here in Palantis. The man was speaking Elven. Tannis was so startled that he could only stare. But Tannis wasn't going to dismiss his carriage on the word of a black-robed mage. He opened his mouth to question the man further when the magic user said, Please, Elistan expects us. Us? Tannis's mind fumbled about in confusion. Since when did Elistan invite black-robed magic users to the Temple of Paladine? Well, the only way to find out, obviously, was to accompany this strange person. Tannis gave his instructions to the coachman. The black-robed figure stood in silence beside him, watching the carriage depart. Then Tannis turned to him. You have the advantage of me, sir. The figure bowed, then cast aside his hood, so that the morning light fell upon his face. I am Dalimar. A dark elf! Tannis said in astonishment, speaking before he thought. He flushed. I I'm sorry, it's just that I never met... One of my kind? No, I don't suppose you would have. We who are cast from the light, as they say, do not often venture onto the sunlit plains of existence. Sometimes, though, even we grow homesick. Tannis followed the dark elf's gaze to the surrounding aspens, of all trees most beloved of the elves. He smiled, feeling much more at ease. The hour for my appointment draws near, and from what you said, Dalimar, I gather that you are somehow involved in this. Perhaps we should continue. Certainly. Dalimar followed Tannis onto the green lawn without hesitation. Tannis was considerably startled to see a swift spasm of pain contort the elf's delicate features. What is it? Are you unwell? No, half-elven, there is nothing you can do to help. Nor am I unwell. Much worse would you look if you stepped into the shoiken grove that guards the dark tower where I live. Then you live there? With Ray? With him? He is my shalafi. So you are his apprentice? Did he send you? If so, thought Tannis, I will leave this place if I have to walk back home to Salanthus. No, but it is of him we will speak. And now I must beg of you to move swiftly. I have a charm given me by Elistan to help me through this trial. But it is not one I care to prolong. Elistan giving charms to black-robed magic users? Raceland's apprentice? Absolutely mystified, Tannis agreeably quickened his steps. Tannis, my friend! Elistan, cleric of Paladine and head of the church on the continent of Ansalon, reached out his hand to the half-elf. Tannis clasped it warmly, trying not to notice how feeble was the cleric's once strong, firm grip. Sending his attendants away, Elistan lay back against the pillows and turned his tired gaze to the dark elf. Dalimar, this journey cannot have been easy for you, but here at my quarters you can, I believe, find ease. What will you take? Wine. Bring wine and food for our guests, Elistan told the clerics, who were filing out of the room, many casting glances of disapproval at the black-robed mage. Escort us, Dinus, here. Then see that we are not disturbed. Astinus, Tannis gasped. Astinus, the chronicler? Yes, half-elven. Dying lends one special significance. Yes, I know I am dying. My months dwindle to weeks. Tannis, well, what was it you told me the forest master said to you in Darken Ward? We do not mourn the loss of those who die fulfilling their destinies. My life has been fulfilled, Tannis. Oh, much more than I could ever have imagined. It was given to me to bring hope back to the world. What man can say more? Oh, I leave knowing that the church has been firmly established once again. There are clerics among all the races now, even Kender. Oh, what a trying time that was, Dennis. <laughs> but they are a good-hearted people. Whenever I started to lose patience, I thought of Paladine and the special love he bore your little friend, Tasselhoff. It seemed to Tannis that Dalimar started at the mention of the kinder's name, but Elistan did not notice. My only regret 
is that I leave no one truly capable of taking over after me. My assistant Gerhard is he's a good man, too good. I see the makings of another king priest in him. But he, he, he doesn't understand yet that the balance must be maintained of good, evil, and neutrality. Uh, is that not so, Delamar? The dark elf nodded his head. Color had returned to his face with the wine. You are wise, Elistan. Oh, perhaps it is not wisdom so much as the ability to see things from all sides, not just one. Elistan turned to Tannis. You, Tannis, my friend, did you not notice and appreciate the view as you came? You looked at the dark tower and you looked at the temple and you thought how right it was they should be so near. Oh, there were many who argued long against this site for the temple. Gerard, and of course Lady Crisania. At the mention of that name, Dalamar choked and set the wine glass down hurriedly. Tana stood up unconsciously, beginning to pace the room. Has there been word of her? Oh, I'm sorry, Tannis, Elistan said gently. You could not have stopped her, nor saved her from her fate, whatever that may be. No, oh, there has been no word of her. Yes, there has, Delamar said. That is one reason I called you together. You called? I thought Alistair asked us here. Is your Shalafi behind this? Is he responsible for this woman's disappearance? Tanis advanced a step, his face beneath his reddish beard flushed. Because by the gods, if he has harmed her, I'll twist his golden neck. Astinus of Palanthus, announced the cleric from the doorway. The historian stood there. His ageless face bore no expression as his grey-eyed gaze swept the room, taking in everything, everyone, with a minute attention to the detail that his pen would soon record. Setting a huge book down upon a table, he opened it to a blank page, drew a quill pen from a wooden case he carried with him, then looked up. Let me guess. You are discussing Raceland Magere. It is true, Dalimar said. I called you here together because it is imperative that I speak to you. I knew Elistan could not come to me. I knew Tannis Havelvin would not come to me. And so I had no choice but to suffer the torment all of my faith feel treading upon this holy ground. Proceed, Steinis said. The world passes as we sit here. You have called us here together. For what reason? Dalimar stared back at him. Our worst fears are realized. Raceland has been successful. Come home. My son, come home. Opening his eyes, Raceland looked into the face of his mother. Smiling, she reached out her hand and stroked his forehead. My poor son, she murmured, her dark eyes soft with grief and love. What did they do to you? I watched, and I've wept. Yes, my son, even the dead weep. It is the only comfort we have. But you are with me now. Here you can rest. Raceland struggled to sit up. Looking down, he saw to his horror that he was covered with blood. Yet he felt no pain. There seemed to be no wound. What happened? Where am I? He was vastly confused. Memories of his childhood came to him. Memories of two childhoods came to him. His and someone else's. He looked at his mother, and she was someone he knew, and she was a stranger. What happened? he repeated irritably. You have died, my son, and now you are here with me. Died? Frantically, he sorted through the memories. He recalled being near death. How was it that he had failed? He put his hand to his forehead and felt flesh, bone, warmth, and then he remembered the portal. No, that's impossible. You lost control of the magic, my son. The field shifted. The forces tore you apart. There was a terrible explosion. It leveled the plains of Durgoth. The magical fortress of Salmon collapsed. I remember, Raceland whispered, putting his hands to his head. I remember the pain, but... He remembered something else, too. 
Brilliant bursts of multicolored lights. He remembered a feeling of exultation and ecstasy welling up in his soul. He remembered the dragon's heads that guarded the portal, screaming in fury. He remembered wrapping his arms around Cursania. Standing up, Raceland looked around. He was on flat, level ground. A desert of some sort. In the distance, he could see mountains. Of course, Thorbarden, the dwarven kingdom. He turned. There were the ruins of the fortress, so he was on the plains of Durgoth. He recognized the landscape. But even as he recognized it, it seemed strange. Everything was tinged with red. There was no sun, yet it was not night. He looked down at the woman kneeling on the ground before him. Raceland smiled. His thin lips pressed together grimly. No, I did not die. I succeeded, he gestured. This is proof of my success. I recognize this place. The Kender described it to me. This is where I entered the portal, and now I stand in the abyss. Raceland grabbed the woman by the arm, dragging her to her feet. Fiend! Apparition! Where is Cressania? Tell me whoever or whatever you are. Tell me, or by the gods I'll... Raceland, stop! You're hurting me! Raceland started, staring. It was Cressania whose arm he held. She looked up at him, puzzled. What's wrong, Raceland? You've been talking so strangely. The archmage tightened his grip. Cressania cried out. Yes, the pain in her eyes was real. So was the fear. Smiling, sighing, Raceland put his arms around her, pressing her close against his body. She was flesh, warmth, perfume, beating heart. Oh, Raceland, I was so frightened. This terrible place, I was all alone. His hand tangled in her black hair. The fragrance of her body intoxicated him, filling him with desire. Raceland looked down at her and stared into eyes of flame. So, you have come home at last, my maid. <laughs> Sultry laughter burned his mind, even as the lithe body in his arms writhed and twisted. He clasped one neck of a five-headed dragon, acid dripped from the gaping jaws above him. Desperately, furiously, Raceland called upon his magic. Yet even as he formed the words, fear pierced his soul. The queen, she's doing this. Ah, Taka is... No, that isn't right. He heard laughter, victorious laughter. Bright light blinded him. He was falling, spiraling down from darkness into day. Opening his eyes, Raceland looked into Chrysania's face. Her face, but it was not the face he remembered. It was aging dying even as he watched. In her hand, she held the platinum medallion of Paladine. Its pure white radiance shone brightly in the eerie pinkish light around them. Raceland closed his eyes to blot out the sight of the cleric's aging face, summoning back memories of how it looked in the past, delicate, beautiful, alive with love. I very nearly lost you, Raceland. Reaching up, but without opening his eyes, he grabbed hold of the cleric's arms, clinging to her desperately. What do I look like? Tell me, Crisania. You are as you were when I first met you in the great library. Yes, thought Raceland. I am as I was, which means I have returned to the present. He felt the old frailty, the need to cough, and he knew the hourglass eyes had returned to him. Shoving Crisania away, he rolled over onto his stomach, clenching his fists in fury, sobbing in anger and fear. Raceland! What is it? Where are we? What's wrong? I succeeded, Crisania. Opening his eyes, he saw her face withering in his sight. We are in the abyss, and my magic is gone. Startled, Crisania stared at him. I don't understand. My magic is gone. I'm weak, helpless here, in the Dark Queen's realm. Suddenly, recollecting that she might be listening, watching, enjoying, Raceland froze. His scream died in the blood-tinged froth upon his lips. He looked about warily. But no, you haven't defeated me! His hand closed over the staff of mages, lying at his side. Leaning upon it heavily, he struggled to his feet. I know where you are, my queen. I sense it. You are in God's home. I know the lay of the land. I know how to move about. The kender gave me the key in his feverish ramblings. The land below mirrors the land above. I will seek you out, though the journey be long and treacherous. I sense your confusion, my queen. 
There is one with me whose mind you cannot touch. She defends and protects me. Do you not, Cressania? Yes, Raislin. Raislin took a step, another, and another. Each step was an effort. Each breath he drew burned. When he looked about this world, all he saw was emptiness. Inside him, all was emptiness. His magic was gone. Raislin stumbled. Crisania caught him and held on to him, clasping him close, tears running down her cheeks. He could hear laughter. Maybe I should give up now, he thought in bitter despair. I am tired, so very tired. And without my magic, what am I? Nothing. Nothing but a weak, wretched child. <laughs> For long moments after Dalimar's pronouncement, there was silence in the room. Then the silence was broken by the scratching of a pen as Astinus recorded the Dark Elf's words in his great book. May Paladine have mercy, Alistair murmured. Is Crusadia with him? Of course, Dalimar snapped. The portal is locked to all, except the combined forces of a black-robed wizard of such powers as his and a white-robed cleric of such faith as hers. Tannis glanced from one to the other, confused. I don't understand. What's going on? What's Raceland done? What what does it have to do with Crisania? And what about Karaman and Tasselhoff? Get a grip on the impatient human half of your nature, half-elven, Estinus remarked. And you, dark elf, begin at the beginning instead of in the middle. Moistening his lips with the wine, Dalimar related the strange tale that Tannis, up until now, had only known in part. Lady Crisania was captivated by Raislam, and if the truth be told, he was attracted to her. He planned a journey back in time to seek the one thing he lacked, the knowledge of the greatest wizard who has ever lived, Fiston Dantilus. He set a trap for Lady Crisania, planning to lure her back in time with him as well as his twin brother, Garamond. But something unforeseen occurred. Raceland's half-sister, Kitiara, a dragon high lord. Blood pounded in Tannis' head, dimming his vision and obscuring his hearing. Kitiara! He could almost see her dark eyes flashing, her lips parted in that charming, crooked smile, the light gleaming off her armor. She lay in his arms, languishing, laughing. Tannis sensed Elistan's sympathetic, pitying gaze. He shrank from the stern, knowing look of Estinus. Wrapped up in his own shame, Tannis did not hear the dark elf's voice quiver when he spoke the woman's name. At Kittyara's command, the death knight, Lord Soth, cast a spell upon Lady Crisania, a spell that should have killed her. But Paladine interceded. He took her soul to dwell with him, leaving the shell of her body behind. I thought the Shalafi was defeated. But no, he turned this betrayal of his sisters into an advantage. His twin brother Keramon and the kinder Tasselhoff Burfoot took Lady Crisania to the Tower of High Sorcery in Weyrith, hoping that the mages would be able to cure her. They could not, of course, as Raceland well knew. They could only send her back in time, to the one period in the history of Kryn where there lived a king-priest powerful enough to call upon Paladine to restore the woman's soul to her body. And this was exactly what Raceland wanted. Fools! I told them they were playing right into his hands. You told them. Tannis felt master of himself enough now to ask this question. You betrayed your Shalafi? It is a dangerous game I play, half-elven. Dalimar's eyes were like the burning embers of the fire. I am a spy sent by the conclave of mages to watch Raceland's every move. Yes, you may well look astonished. They fear him. All of the orders fear him. The white, the red, the black. Most especially the black, for we know what our fate will be should he rise to power. As Tanner stared, the dark elf slowly parted the front closure of his black robes, laying bare his breast. Five oozing wounds marred the surface of his smooth skin. The mark of his hand, Delamar said. My reward for my treachery. Shaking his head, feeling second, 
Thanos sank back in his chair, his gaze on the floor. But they would not listen to me, Dalimar continued. As Raceland had foreseen, their greatest hope lay in their greatest fear. They decided to send Lady Cressania back in time, ostensibly so that the king priest could aid her. That is what they told Garamond, for they knew he would not go otherwise. But in reality they sent her back to die, or to at least disappear as did all other clerics before the cataclysm. And they hoped that Caramon, when he went back into time and learned the truth about his twin, learned that Brayston was, in reality, distant Dantilus, that he would be forced to kill his brother. Caramon! Tannis laughed bitterly. The only thing Caramon can kill now is a bottle of spirits! Catching Astinus's irritated gaze, Tannis subsided, and Dalimar continued. But the Kender, Tesselhoff Burfoot, disrupted Parsalian's spell and accidentally traveled back in time with Garamon. The introduction of Ekenda into the flow of time made it possible for time to be altered. What happened back there, in Istar? We can only surmise. What we do know is that Crisania did not die. Garamon did not kill his brother, and Raceland was successful in obtaining the knowledge of Fist and Dantilus. Taking Crisania with him, he moved forward in time to the one period when he would possess, in Crisania, the only true cleric in the land. He travelled to the one period in our history when the Queen of Darkness would be most vulnerable and unable to stop him. As Fist and Dantilus did before him, Raceland fought the Dwarfgate War, and so obtained access to the portal that stood then in the magical fortress of Zaman. If history had repeated itself, Raceland should have died at that portal, for thus did Fiston Dantilus meet his doom. We counted on this, Alistair murmured. Barsalian said that there was no way Raceland could change history. That wretched Kender, Delamar snarled. Barsalian should have realized the miserable creature would leap at a chance for some new adventure. He should have taken our advice and smothered the little bastard. Tell me what's happened to Tasselhoff and Caramon, Tannis interrupted. I don't care what's become of Raceland or Lady Crisania. I'm sorry for her, but she refused to see the truth. What has become of my friends? We do not know, Delamar said. But if I were you, I would not look to see them again in this life. They would be of little use to the Shalafi. You have told me all I need to hear, Tannis rose, his voice taut with grief and fury. If it's the last thing I do, I'll seek out Raceland and I'll... Sit down, Hathoven. Dalimar said. You will care what becomes of Raceland, because it affects all of us. I said when I began that our worst fears were realized. Raceland has entered the abyss. He and Lady Crisania will challenge the Dark Queen. Tanner stared at Dalimar in disbelief. Then he burst out laughing. What well, the mage has sealed his own doom? Estinus kept writing. Elistan's frail shoulders slumped. Tanner stared at all of them. You can't consider this a serious threat. By the gods, I have stood before the Queen of Darkness. I would felt her power. And that was when she was only partially in this plane of existence. I can't imagine what it would be like to meet her on her own... Her own... Raceland knows, Delamar said. We all know that he cannot defeat the Queen of Darkness on her own plane of existence. Therefore, it is his plan to draw her out. To bring her back through the portal and into the world. Tannis felt as if he had been punched in the stomach. That's madness. We barely defeated her the last time. He's going to bring her back into the world? Unless he can be stopped, Delamar replied, which is my duty as a mage. So what are we supposed to do? Patience, Tannis, Elistan interrupted. You are nervous and afraid. We all share these feelings, but nothing will be gained by rash acts or wild words. I believe that we have not yet heard the worst. Is that true, Dalimar? Yes, revered son. I have received word that Dragon High Lord Kitiara is planning a full-scale assault on Palantis. Wait! Tanis stopped him. You said Kitiara was furious with Raceland. You said she was just as frightened of the Queen re-entering the world as we are. That was why she ordered Soth to kill Crisania. If that's true... Why is she attacking Palanthus? That doesn't make sense. 
She grows in strength daily in sanction. The evil dragons have congregated there, and we have reports that the draconians who were scattered after the war have been regrouping under her command. But sanction's a long way from Palanthus. The lands of the Knights of Salamnia lie in between. The good dragons will rise up and fight if the evil ones take to the skies again. Why would she risk all she has gained? Dalimar smiled. True. When Kitty Ara first heard about Raceland's plan, she was frightened. But now it seems she thinks he has a chance to win. And Kit will always try to be on the winning side. She plans to conquer Palanthus and be prepared to greet the wizard as he passes through the portal. Kit will offer the might of her armies to her brother. He can easily convert the evil creatures from their allegiance to the Dark Queen to serving his cause. Dalimar rose to his feet. I never trusted her. I knew what treachery she was capable of committing. None better. This game is no surprise. Who told you all this? Astinus asked. Lord Soth, the Death Knight, told me. Soth? Tannis felt himself losing his grip on reality. Frantically, his brain scrambled for a handhold. Mages spying on mages, clerics of light aligned with wizards of darkness, dark trusting light, light turning to the dark. Soth has pledged allegiance to Kitiara? Why would he betray her? Dalimar looked into Tannis' eyes. For the span of a heartbeat, there was a bond between the two, a bond forged by a shared understanding, a shared misery, a shared passion. Suddenly Tannis understood, and his soul shriveled in horror. He wants her dead, Dalimar replied. Chrysania stared around. Where was she? Where was Raislin? He had been with her only moments before, leaning weakly on her arm. And then, suddenly, he had vanished and she had found herself alone, walking in a strange village. The houses of the town were built in the trees. She saw a signpost. Solace. How strange, she marveled, looking around. It was Solace, all right. She had been here recently with Thanis Halfelven, looking for Caramon. But this Solace was different. Everything seemed tinged with red. She kept wanting to rub her eyes to clear them. Bracelin, she called. There was no answer. The people passing by acted as if they neither heard her nor saw her. Bracelin, she began to panic. What had happened to him? Had the Dark Queen... She heard a commotion, children shouting and yelling, and above the noise, a thin, high-pitched scream for help. Turning, Chrysania saw a crowd of children gathered around a form huddled on the ground. She saw fists flailing and feet kicking. She saw a stick raised and then brought down hard. Gathering her white robes in her hand, Chrysania ran toward the children. The figure in the center of the circle was a child, a young boy. They were killing him. She grabbed hold of one of the children to pull him away. The child whirled to face her. Its white skin was stretched taut over the bones. Its lips were tinged with violet. The teeth were black and rotting. The child lashed out at her with its hand. Long nails ripped her skin, sending a paralyzing pain through her. Gasping, she let go, and the child, with a grin of perverted pleasure, turned back to torment the boy on the ground. Staring at the bleeding marks upon her arm, dizzy and weak from the pain, Chrysania heard the boy cry out again. Paladine, help me, she prayed. Give me strength. Resolutely, she grabbed hold of one of the demon children and hurled it aside, and then she grabbed another. Managing to reach the boy upon the ground, she shielded his bleeding, unconscious body with her own. Again and again, she felt the long nails tear her skin, the poison course through her body. But once they touched her, the children drew back in pain themselves. Finally, they withdrew, leaving her, bleeding and sick, alone with their victim. Gently, she turned the bruised body of the young boy over. There was no mistaking that delicate facial structure, the fragile bones, the jutting chin. Raislin, she whispered, holding his small hand in her own. The boy opened his eyes. The man, dressed in black robes, sat up. Chrysania stared at him as he looked grimly around. What's happening? she asked. Raislin nodded to himself. This is how she torments me, striking at me where she knows I am weakest. You fought for me, Chrysania. You defeated her. He drew her close, still shivering. Chrysania laid her head on the archmage's breast, smelling that faint fragrance of rose petals. 
and death. So, this is what comes of his courageous words and promises, said Kitiara in a low voice. Did you really expect otherwise? asked Lord Soth. The Death Knight's orange eyes were burning with a strange intensity. Kitiara flushed. Realizing she was revealing more emotion than she intended, she turned from Soth abruptly. Walking across the room, which was furnished with an odd mixture of armor, weaponry, perfumed sheets, and thick fur rugs, Kitiara clasped the folds of her filmy nightdress together across her breasts with a shaking hand. It was a gesture that accomplished little in the way of modesty, and Kitiara knew it, but she suddenly felt uncomfortable under the gaze of those blazing eyes, staring at her from a non-existent face. He is, after all, a dark elf, Soth went on. And he fears your brother more than death itself. So is it any wonder that he chooses to fight on Raceland's side rather than that of a bunch of feeble old wizards? But Dalimar stood to gain so much. They promised him the leadership of the Black Robes. He was certain to take Parsalian's place after that as head of the Conclave, undisputed master of magic on Kryn. And you would have known other rewards as well, Dark Elf. Kittyara added silently. Once my insane brother is defeated, no one will be able to stop you. What are our plans? You ruling with the staff, I with the sword. Moving with unheard steps, the Death Knight walked across the room. Coming to stand next to Kittyara, he laid his hand upon her shoulder. She flinched at the touch of the invisible fingers, their cold piercing her heart. But she did not withdraw. Well, Soth, what do we do to stop Dalimar and my brother in this madness? What do we do before the Dark Queen destroys us all? You must attack Palanthus. With a nod, Kitiara left to assemble her generals. Looking after her, the undead knight smiled. Yes, his twisted plan was working perfectly. Already he had set the two lovers against each other. Each thought the other was supporting Raceland. The war would now unfold. Raceland would be stopped. Both Dalimar and Kitiara would be killed. Then she would be his forever. Tannis journeyed to Sandcrest, headquarters of the Knights of Solamnia, to see Lord Gunther, head of the Knights. Tannis tried to convince Gunther to mobilize the Knights to fight Kitiara's army and to defend the High Clarist's tower, which guarded the only land approach to Palanthus. Gunther was skeptical at first. After all, Kitiara's forces were no match in numbers for those of the knights and the Palantheans. Besides, Gunther found Tannis' story about Raistlin entering the Abyss utterly beyond belief. But Gunther also had a great respect for Tannis, growing out of Tannis' heroic exploits during the War of the Lance. In the end, the knight agreed to fortify the High Clarist's tower, and he journeyed with Tannis back to Palanthus. There, the two of them tried without success to convince Amathus, the lord of the city, to take the threat of invasion seriously. Finally, Gunther took matters into his own hands and began himself to arrange for the defense of the city. Even as Gunther and Lord Amathus conferred, Tannis had received an urgent summons. Alistan was dying and wanted to see him. Arriving in Alistan's chambers, Tannis was surprised to see Dalimar sitting there. The dark elf had brought a potion to ease the dying cleric's pain. Alistan, it seemed, had once done the same for Raistlin when he'd been sick. Alistan gave Tannis a sealed note for Crescenia. He had designated her to become the next head of the church, if she survived. Alistan told Tannis not to grieve, that an old friend was coming to take him on a journey. As Tannis left, he saw an old wizard coming in. It was none other than Paladine, in his guise of the dotty old mage Fizban. Turning to Tannis when no one was looking... The god told Tannis that he now faced his darkest hour. There was hope, he said, but first, love would have to triumph. The old wizard disappeared into Elistan's room, and Tannis went off to help with the defense of the city. 
Meanwhile, in the abyss, the Dark Queen threw nightmare after nightmare at Raistlin. The nightmares were real, filled with real pain, real wounds. But each time, Chrysania shielded him, taking the blows so he wouldn't have to. Once, they found themselves in a nightmare where they were being tried as witches by all Raistlin's old friends, Tannis, Flint, Sturm, Tass, even Caramon, and were condemned to burn at the stake. Tannis advanced, a flaming torch in his hand. He turned to look at Raislin. Witness her fate and see your own witch, the half-elf shouted. No! Raislin struggled, but Caramon held him fast. Tannis thrust the blazing torch into the oil-soaked tinder. It caught. The fire spread quickly, soon engulfing Chrysania's white robes. Raislin heard her anguished scream above the roar of the flame. She managed to raise her head, seeking one final look at Raislin. Seeing the pain and terror in her eyes and her love for him, Raceland's heart burned with a fire hotter than any man could create. They want magic? I'll give them magic! He shoved the startled Caramon away and, breaking free, raised his arms to the heavens. At that moment, the words of magic entered his soul, never to leave again. Lightning streaked from his fingers, striking the clouds in the red-tinged sky. Raceland turned in fury upon the crowd, but the people had vanished disappeared as though they had never existed. Ah, my queen. <laughs> Laughter bubbled on his lips. Joy shot through his soul as the ecstasy of his magic burned in his blood. At last he understood. He had been deceived by himself. Tass had given him the clue at Zaman, but he had not bothered to think it through. I thought of something in my mind, the Kender said, and there it was. When I wanted to go somewhere, all I had to do was think about it. And either it came to me or I went to it. I'm not sure. It was all the cities I have ever been in, and yet none. So the kindred told him. I assume the abyss was a reflection of the world, Raceland realized. But it is nothing more than a reflection of my mind. All I have been doing is traveling through my own mind. The queen is in God's home, because that is where I perceived her to be. And God's home is as far away or as near as I choose. My magic did not work because I doubted it, not because she prevented it from working. I have come close to defeating myself. Ah, but now I know, my queen. Now I know and now I can triumph. For God's home is just a step away, and it is only another step to the portal. Raceland, The voice was low, agonized, spent. Raceland turned. Chrysania lay on the ground. The smell of burned flesh was strong. Raceland kneeled and turned her over. Chrysania! Her face was horribly burned. Sightless eyes stared into the emptiness around her. Raceland, I, I can't see. Is that you? Yes. Raceland. I failed. No, Chrysania, you have not. I'm unharmed. My magic is stronger now than it has ever been before in any of the times I have lived. I will go forward now and defeat the Dark Queen. The hand holding Raceland's tightened its feeble grasp. Then my prayers have been granted. She choked. A spasm of pain twisted her body. I'm dying, Raceland. Soon Paladine will take me to him. Stay with me, Raislin. Stay with me while I die. Raislin gazed down at the remains of the wretched woman before him. Holding her hand, he had a sudden vision of her as he had seen her in the forest, the one time he had come close to losing control and making her his own. Her white skin, her silken hair, her shining eyes. He remembered the love in those eyes, he remembered holding her close in his arms. He remembered kissing the smooth skin. One by one, Raislin burned those memories in his mind, setting fire to them with his magic. Reaching out his other hand, he freed himself from her clinging grasp. Raislin! Her hand clutched at the empty air in terror. You have served my purpose, revered daughter. Time presses. Even now come those to the portal at Palanthus who will try to stop me. I must challenge the queen, fight my final battle with her minions. Then, when I have won, 
I must return to the portal and enter it before anyone has a chance to stop me. Oh, Raceland, don't leave me alone in the darkness. Leaning upon the staff of Magius, Raceland rose to his feet. Farewell, revered daughter. I need you no longer. Chrysania heard the rustle of his black robes as he walked away. She heard the soft thud of the staff of Magius. And then there was only silence. She knew he was gone. She remembered the words of Lorelon, the elven cleric, the fall of Istar. The next time you will see Chrysania is when you are blinded by darkness. Darkness unending. I see now, she whispered. I see so clearly. I have deceived myself. I've been nothing to him, nothing but his game piece, to move about the board of his great game as he chose. And even as he used me, so I used him. I used him to further my pride, my ambition. My darkness only deepened his own. He is lost, and I have led him to his downfall. For if he does defeat the Dark Queen, it will be but to take her place. Staring up at the heavens she could not see, Chrysania screamed in agony. Let death come, Paladine! Lying there in the eternal darkness, Chrysania's heart wept the tears her eyes could not. I love you, Raceland. I could never tell you. I could never admit it to myself. Oh, what might have changed if I had? She drew a breath. Paladine. Forgive me. Another breath. Raceland. Another softer breath. Forgive. Tannis stood outside the temple, thinking about the old wizard's words. Then he snorted. Love must triumph. Tannis shook his head bitterly. Fizban's magic wasn't going to work this time. Love didn't even have a bit part in this play. Raceland had long ago twisted and used his twin's love to his own ends, finally crushing Caramon into a drunken mass of blubbery flesh. Marble had more capacity to love than did the marble maiden Chrysania. And as for Kitiara, had she ever loved? Tennis scowled. He hadn't meant to think of her, not again. No, Kitiara had never loved him. When a chance came to gain what she truly wanted, power... She had left him without a second thought. But even as he turned the key in the lock of his soul, Tannis heard once again Kitiara's voice, speaking the words she had spoken the night of the downfall of the Queen of Darkness. The night Kitiara had helped both him and Lorana to escape. Farewell, half-elfin. Remember, I do this for love of you. A dark figure, like the embodiment of his own shadow, appeared beside Tannis. The figure spoke a word of greeting. Tannis hoped the dark elf had not noticed how abstracted his thoughts had been. He was more than half afraid, in fact, that Delamore might have guessed them. Clearing his throat gruffly, Tannis glanced at the black-robed mage. Is Elistan dead? No, not yet. But I sensed the approach of one whose presence I would find most uncomfortable. And so, seeing that my services were no longer necessary, I left. I have discharged my Shalafi's debt, after all. How dedicated are you to Raceland, Dalimar? The dark elf laughed. I care for one thing only. The art. The magic. When I volunteered to spy upon him, I knew I might well sacrifice my life. But how little was that price to pay for the chance of studying with one so gifted? How could I afford to lose him? Even now, when I think of what I must do to him, when I think of the knowledge he has gained that will be lost when he dies, I almost... Almost what? Almost let him through the portal? Can you truly stop him when he comes back, Dalimar? Will you stop him? In their infinite wisdom, the mages who created the portals made them so that only one of goodness and purity, with absolute trust in the one person in the world who could never merit trust, could hold the doorway open. That, they reasoned, would never happen. But the mages never foresaw that love would overthrow their grand design. So you see, Half-Elvin, 
When Raislan attempts to re-enter the portal from the abyss, I must stop him, for the queen will be right behind him. But can you stop him? Tannis's gaze went to Dalamar's chest, where the gaping wounds festered under the black robes. Dalamar caught his glance. I know my own limitations, half-elfin. I will be honest with you. If my Shalifi were in the full strength of his power when he tried to come through the portal, then no, I could not stop him. No one could. But Raislin will not be. He will already have expanded much of his power in destroying the Queen's minions and forcing her to face him alone. He will be weak and injured. His only hope is to draw the Dark Queen out here onto his plane. Here he can regain strength. Here she will be the weaker of the two. And thus, yes, because he will be injured, I can stop him. And yes, I will stop him. You see, Herr Velvin, I have been offered enough to make it worth my while. With that, he bowed, and murmuring the words of the spell, vanished. But as he left, Tannis heard Delamar's voice speak through the night. You have looked upon the sun for the last time, half elven. Raislin and the Dark Queen have met. The battle begins. Tomorrow, there will be no dawn. The next day, there was no dawn. Green and purple clouds covered the sky, with multicolored lightning flashing everywhere. Tannis and Lord Gunther stood on the battlements of the High Clarist's Tower, waiting for the approach of Kitiara's attacking army. But Kitiara had developed a brilliant stratagem. She had succeeded in mobilizing a flying citadel, one of the huge fortresses ripped from the earth by dark magic during the War of the Lance. Realizing that the Knight's Code of Honor would prevent them from attacking first, she directed her force to hold its fire. Tannis and Gunther were shocked to realize the truth of Kitiara's intentions, she was going to bypass the High Clarist's Tower altogether and attack Polanthus directly. Lord Gunther thought the plan was madness. Polanthus was now defended by a great number of troops. The good dragons would rise up to fight if attacked. Besides, the knights at the Clarist's Tower could reach the city in four days, pinning Kitiara's troops between the city and themselves. But Tannis reminded Gunther of Kitiara's great equalizer, Lord Soth and his troop of skeletal warriors. Summoning the bronze dragon fire flash, Tannis flew off for Palanthus to warn the city. If only he wasn't too late. Where's Lord Amothus? Tannis demanded, shoving his way inside the huge doors of the palace, nearly bowling over an astonished footman. Asleep, sir. It's only mid-morning. Get him up. Who's in charge of the knights? Uh, Sir Markham, sir. Knight of the Rose. Shall I send... Yes! Send for Sir Markham and for the mage Dalimar, too. That will be unnecessary, half Elvin said a smooth voice. A black-robed figure materialized within the hallway of the palace, startling Tannis, traumatizing the footman. You are powerful, Tannis remarked, drawing near the dark elf magic user. I need to talk to you privately. Come in here. Following Tannis, Dalimar smiled coolly. I wish I could accept the compliment, half-elven, but I saw from the laboratory window of the dark tower the arrival of the bronze dragon in the palace courtyard. I have need to talk to you as much as you to me. Therefore, I am here. Tannis shut the door. Quickly, before the others come. You know what is headed this way? I knew last night. I sent word to you, but you had already left. Tannis looked at Dalimar intently. The dark elf was calm and collected. He certainly appeared to be someone who could be relied upon to perform with cool courage in a tight spot. Unfortunately, just who he would perform for was open to doubt. Tannis rubbed his forehead. How confusing this was. Back in the old days, good and evil had been clearly defined, and everyone knew which side they were fighting for or against. Now he was allied with evil fighting against evil. How was that possible? Evil turns in upon itself. So Elistan read from the holy discs of Mishakal. Shaking his head, Tanis realized he was wasting time. He had to trust Dalimar. At least he had to trust to his ambition. Is there any way to stop Lord Soth, Dalimar? No, there is nothing that can be done. Not now, at any rate. You, can you stop him? I dare not leave my post beside the portal. 
I came this time because I know Raceland is still far from it, but every breath we draw brings him nearer. That was why I came to warn you. There is little time. He's winning? You've always underestimated him, half Elvin. I told you, he is now the greatest wizard who has ever lived. Of course he is winning. Tennis frowned. Dalimar certainly didn't sound like an apprentice who was prepared to kill his Shalafi if need arose. But to return to Lord Soth, said Dalimar. When I first realized that he would use this opportunity to take his own revenge upon the city and the people that had cast him out during his lifetime, I contacted the Tower of High Sorcery in Wayward Forest. Of course, Tannis gasped in relief. Parsalian, the Conclave, they could... There was no answer to my message, Dalimar continued, ignoring the interruption. Something strange is transpiring there. I do not know what. My messenger found the way barred. I will continue to try, but we cannot count on them, and they are the only magic users powerful enough to stop a death knight. Tannis pondered a moment. Kit's destination will be the Tower of High Sorcery to meet and help her brother, right? And to try to stop me, Dalimar said, his face paling. Can Kittyara get through the Shoiken Grove? Raceland gave her a charm. Give me a charm, too. Let me inside the tower. I can deal with her. Oh, yes, Dalimar returned, amused. I know how well you dealt with her in the past. Listen, half-elven, you will have all you can handle trying to keep control of the city. Besides, you have forgotten one thing, Soth's true purpose in this. He wants Kittyara dead. He wants her for himself. He told me as much. If he can accomplish her death and avenge himself upon Palanthus for condemning him to death, he will have succeeded. He couldn't care less about Raceland. Feeling suddenly chilled to the very soul, Tannis could not reply. He had, indeed, forgotten Soth's objective. The half-elf shuddered. Kittyara had done much that was evil, but did she deserve this? An endless life of cold and dark torment, bound forever in unholy marriage to this creature of the abyss. A curtain of darkness shrouded Tannis's vision. Dizzy, weak, he felt himself falling. There was a sensation of being enfolded in soft black cloth. He felt strong hands supporting him, guiding him. Then, nothing. When Tannis awoke, he was in the company of Sir Markham and Lord Amathus. He told them what had happened to the High Clarist's Tower, and what would surely happen to Palanthus the next morning. The two men were aghast. Well said Sir Markham glumly. There's no point in remaining sober. We'll all soon be dead anyway. I just can't understand it, Lord Amathus grieved. How could such a fate befall my beautiful city? Why? Tannis, still feeling unwell, begged leave to retire to his guest quarters. There he wrote a letter of farewell to his wife, Lorana. My darling, it ended. While I am sure I will never see you again in this life, we will be together forever in Paladine's holy realm. He gave the letter to a messenger to deliver to Sylvanesti. Soon Lord Gunthar arrived in the city and called a meeting with its commanders, Lord Amathus, Sir Markham, and Tannis. On his way to the meeting, Tannis was waylaid by Dalimar, who had returned to the palace to give the half-elf a magical silver bracelet. Putting it on Tannis's wrist, Dalimar said, it will protect you from Lord Soth's words of power. Die, stun, and blind. Dalimar sighed. There's one other thing I must tell you. Lady Crisani has been mortally wounded, protecting Raceland, and he has left her to die alone. In the war room, Tannis told the other commanders about the charm Dalimar had given him. I'll face Lord Soth myself, he announced. A troop of knights can come with me to take on Soth's skeletal warriors. Lord Gunthar nodded. The city's been put on the alert. Knights are on their way, as are the good dragons. But it seems unlikely they can reach the city in time. There's no chance of escape by sea, not with the high waves the storm has brought on. Gunthar frowned and pointed at his map. My guess is that the Draconians will drop into the city from the Flying Citadel, while simultaneously the evil dragons will attack and Lord Soth will sweep through the gates. Tannis nodded in agreement. Yes, 
And meanwhile, Kitty R will try to reach the Tower of High Sorcery. She will wait for Soth before actually entering, however, since her charm only protects her from the Guardians in the Grove, not inside the Tower itself. Only I'm going to see to it that Lord Soth never makes it to the Grove. Their plans made, the Commanders, and the great city itself waited for the dawn. State your business, the guard at the great gates of Palanthus said, coming forward to stand in front of the two figures who had appeared out of the night. I'm Tasselhoff Burfoot, the kender held his hand out to the guard. And this is my friend Caramon. We're from... So Our business depends on where we are, said the man called Caramon. You mean you don't know where you are, the guard asked. We're not from this part of the country, the big man answered coolly. We lost our map. Seeing the lights of the city, we naturally headed toward it. Eh, yeah, and I'm Lord Amothus, thought the guard. You're in Palanthus. The big man glanced behind him. So that must be New City behind us. Where are all the people? We've walked the length and breadth of the town, no sign of anyone. We're under alert. Everyone's been taken inside the walls to the old city. Now what's your business here? And how is it you don't know what's going on? The word's over half the country by now, I reckon. The big man ran his hand across an unshaven jaw smiling ruefully. Full bottle of spirits kind of blots out most everything. True enough, Captain? True enough. And also true enough that this fellow's eyes were sharp and clear and filled with a fixed purpose, a firm resolve. Will you let us inside? The big man asked. I guess from the look of things you could use another couple of fighters. We can use a man your size, the guard scowled down at the kinder. But I mistrust we should just leave him here for buzzard bait. I'm a fighter, too, the Kender protested. Why, I saved Caramon's life once. Do you want to hear about it? It's the most wonderful story. We were in a magical fortress. Raceland had taken me there after he killed my friend. But, uh, well, never mind about that. Anyway, there were these dark dwarves and... Open the gate, the old guard shouted. Come on, Tass, the big man said. But I just got to the best part. Oh, by the way, the big man turned around, first deftly squelching the Kender with his hand. Can you tell me the date? Third day, fifth month, 356. Oh, and you might be wanting a cleric to look at that leg of yours. Clerics, the big man murmured to himself. That's right, I'd forgotten. There are clerics now. Thank you, he called out as he and the kender walked through the gates. What's it say, Caramon? Taz stood on tiptoe, trying to peer over the big man's arm. Shh, I'm reading. But those... The big man had been leafing hurriedly through the volume of chronicles he had taken from Astinus. But he had stopped turning pages and was now studying one intently. With a sigh, after all, he'd carried the book. Taz slumped back against the wall and looked around. They were standing beneath one of the flaming braziers that Palantheans used to light the streets at night. It was nearly dawn, the Kender guessed. A chill fog curled up from the bay, swirling and winding through the streets. Oh, no, Caramon muttered. What? What? Listen to this. On the morning of third day, the flying citadel appeared in the air above Palanthus, accompanied by flights of blue dragons in black. And with the appearance of the citadel in the air, there came before the gates of Old City Lord Soth, Knight of the Black Rose, mounted upon a nightmare with eyes of flame. He rode unchallenged toward the city gate, the guards fleeing before him in terror, and there he stopped. Lord of Palanthus, the Death Knight called, surrender your city to Lord Kitiara. Give up to her the keys to the Tower of High Sorcery, name her ruler of Palanthus, and your city will be spared destruction. Lord Amothus, although pale as death himself, stood tall and straight, his words bringing back courage to those who had lost it. Take this message to your dragon high lord. We will not buy peace at the price of our freedom. Then buy it at the price of your lives, Lord Soth shouted. Out of the air materialized his legions, thirteen skeletal warriors, and the spirits of those elven women constrained by the gods to serve Soth. To hear their wailing cry alone, meant death. Lord Soth spoke a word of magic, and at that word, a dreadful cold swept over all who watched. The iron of the gate began to whiten with frost, 
Then it changed to ice. Then, at another word from Soth, the gate shattered. Soth charged through the broken gate, his legions following. Waiting for him on the other side of the gate, mounted upon the bronze dragon fire flash, was Tannis Hathelvin, hero of the lance. Immediately upon sighting his opponent, the Death Knight shouted the magical power word, Die! Tannis Hathelvin, being protected by the silver bracelet of magic resistance, was not affected by the spell, but the bracelet that saved his life in this first attack could help him no longer. The bronze dragon he rode, having no magical protection, died at Sos command, forcing Tannis Hathelvin to fight the Death Knight on foot. Lord Soth dismounted to meet his opponent according to the laws of combat as set forth by the Knights of Salamnia, these laws binding the Death Knight still. Tannis Hathelvin fought bravely, but fell, mortally wounded. The Death Knight soared in his chest. No! Tass gasped. No! We can't let Tannis die! Reaching up, he tugged on Karaman's arm. Oh, let's go! There's still time! We can find him and warn him! I've got to go to the tower, Karaman said. I can sense Raceland's presence drawing closer to me. I don't have time, Tass. But we can't just let him die! We're not going to, Tass. You're going to save him. Me? But, Karaman, I'm not a warrior! Tasselhoff Burfoot, we're part of this world, and we've got to take some responsibility for it. I see this now. I see it very clearly. But I'm such a short part of the world. A trumpet sounded, then another. That's it, isn't it? Tass said softly. Yes, you'd better hurry. Closing the book, Caramon shoved it carefully into an old knapsack he carried. Then the big man laid his hand on Tass's head smoothing back the top knot. Goodbye, Tess. Thank you. But, Caramon, wh 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 where will you be? Caramon glanced up into the sky to where the Tower of High Sorcery loomed. Lights burned in the top windows where the laboratory and the portal were located. Goodbye, Tess. I've got to do this. You know what will happen if I don't. And you know what you've got to do, too. Now hurry up. The Citadel's probably over the gate by now. But, Caramon... Tass! Are you going to let Tannis die without trying to help him? No, Caramon, it's just... I'm not sure what I can do. You'll think of something. You always do. G g goodbye, Caramon. I, I, I won't let you down. I know you won't, Tass. No matter what happens. With a wave, Caramon set off down the street. Tass stood for a moment, watching Caramon until he lost him in the darkness. Tass's heart was in his mud-coated shoes, making them feel even heavier as he trudged off in the opposite direction. He had absolutely no idea how he was going to go about rescuing Tannis from a death knight. Suddenly, he stopped in the middle of the street. Caramon got rid of me! Sending me to rescue Tannis was just an excuse! Now what do I do? He took a step toward Caramon. Then he heard a trumpet sound again, and above it, he thought he could hear Tannis's voice. But if I go to Caramon, Tannis will die. Both of them need me. How can I choose? Suddenly his brow cleared. I know. That's it. With a great sigh of relief, Tass ran in the direction of the gate. I'll rescue Tannis, and then I'll just come back and rescue Caramon. Tannis might even be of some help to me. <laughs> I wonder how many heroes this makes that I've had to save. Frankly, I'm getting just a bit fed up with all of them. As Tasselhoff ran off to rescue Tannis, he saw the citadel float over the city gates. He saw Kitiara riding on her blue dragon sky, flying toward the Tower of High Sorcery. Everything was happening just as written in Astinus's Chronicles. It was up to Tass to change things. Tannis was addressing his knights when the Kender ran up to him, Tasselhoff tried to convince him to help save Karaman instead of facing Lord Soth. But Tannis, believing Karaman was dead, thought Tass must have lost his mind. Finally realizing Tannis was not going to come with him of his own free will, Tass did what came naturally. He stole the silver bracelet right off Tannis's wrist, the bracelet that was Tannis's only defense against the Death Knight. Lord Soth had broken through the gates and was rapidly advancing toward Tannis. The half-elf, knowing he could not win without the bracelet, sent Fireflash to capture Tass and recover it. Tannis followed after him. 
The dragon pinned Tash to the ground, and Tannis came running up after him. The half-elf shook all the loot out of the kender's pouches, but he couldn't find the magical bracelet. And Tass refused to give it to him, explaining that Tannis would have died at Lord Soth's hands, that Caramon was alive and trying to thwart Raistlin's plan. He didn't have time to say more. Lord Soth was approaching. But luckily, it was enough to convince Tannis to come with him. It had taken every bit of Caramon's nerve and courage to approach the Shoikin Grove. Now he stood before those dark, silent trees, shivering and sweating and trying to make himself take one more step. My death lies in there, he murmured to himself. But I have faced death a hundred times. His hand gripping the hilt of his sword, Caramon edged a foot forward. No, I will not die, he shouted at the forest. Too much depends on me, and I will not be stopped by... by trees! He edged his other foot forward. I have walked in darker places than this. I have walked the forest of Weyrith. I have walked Crin when it was dying. I have seen the end of the world. No, this forest holds no terrors that I cannot overcome. With that, Caramon strode forward into the grove and was immediately plunged into total darkness. He fell to his knees, sobbing and shivering in terror. Your hours, whispered soft hissing voices. Your blood, your warmth, your life. Bring us your sweet blood, your warm flesh. We are cold, cold beyond endurance. Come closer, closer. Caramon had only to turn and run and he would escape. But no, I must stop Raceland. I must go on. For the first time, Caramon reached far down within himself and found the same indomitable will that had led his twin to overcome frailty and pain and even death itself to achieve his goal. Gritting his teeth, Caramon crawled through the dirt. It was a valiant effort, but he did not get far. Staring into the darkness, he watched in paralyzed fascination as a fleshless hand reached up to the ground. Cold fingers began dragging him down, sucking him under. The cold froze his heart. I have failed. Caramon, came a worried voice. Tannis, he's coming around. Caramon opened his eyes and stared into the face of the half-elf, who was looking at him with an expression of relief mingled with amazement and admiration. Tannis, sitting up groggily, Caramon embraced his friend, sobbing in relief. My friend. Tannis was prevented from saying anything more by his own tears choking him. Uh, are you all right, Caramon? Tass asked, hovering near. Yes, I guess so. That was the bravest thing I've seen any man do, Tannis said. The bravest. And the stupidest. Caramon flushed. Yeah, well, you know me. I used to. Tannis scratched his beard. His gaze took in the big man's splendid physique, his expression of quiet resolve. Damn it, Caramon. A month ago you passed out dead drunk at my feet. Your gut practically dragged on the floor. And now... Caramon got to his feet. I've lived years, Tannis. That's all I can tell you. But what happened? How did I get out of that horrible place? Glancing behind him, he saw the shadows of the trees far down at the end of the street. I found you, Tannis said. They were dragging you under. You would have had an uneasy resting place there, my friend. How did you get in? This, Tannis said, smiling and holding up a silver bracelet. It got you in? Then maybe. No, Caramon. Tannis tucked the bracelet back inside his belt with a sidelong glance at Tass, who was looking extremely innocent. Its magic was barely strong enough to get me to the edge of those cursed woods. I could feel its power dwindling. Caramon's eager expression faded. I tried our magical device too, Tass. It doesn't work either. But Tannis, I have to reach the tower. I can't explain. But I've seen the future. I must go into the portal and stop Raceland. I'm the only one who can. Tannis laid a calming hand on the big man's shoulder. So Tass told me, sort of. But Caramon, Dalimar's there, and... How in the name of the gods can you get inside the portal anyway? Tannis, you cannot understand, and there is no time to explain. But you've got to believe me. I must get into that tower. You're right, 
Tanner stared at Caramon in mystified wonder. I don't understand, but I'll help you, if I can. Caramon's head drooped. Thank you, my friend. I've been through so much. If it hadn't been for Tass... He looked over at the kinder, but Tass wasn't listening. His rapt gaze was fixed on the flying citadel, still hovering over the city walls as thick columns of smoke rose from the southern part of the city below it. I'll bet a person could fly that citadel to the tower, Tass said. Whoosh! Right over the grove! If we could only get up there, Tanner stared at the citadel. The magical device! Caramon cried in excitement, fishing it out of his pocket. This will take us there! Really? Tass gasped. Into the flying citadel? Oh, that's so wonderful! I'm ready. Let's go! But wait! That device only works for two people, Caramon. How will Tanis get up? Caramon cleared his throat uncomfortably, and comprehension dawned upon the kender. Oh, no! Tass wailed. No! I'm sorry, Tass, Caramon said, as he once again transformed the small, nondescript pendant into a brilliant bejeweled scepter. We're going to have a stiff fight on our hands to get inside that thing. I need Tannis with me. I need his strength, his sword. You understand, don't you? Tass tried to smile, but his lower lip quivered. Yes, Caramon, I understand. And after all, it was your idea, Caramon added solemnly. While this thought appeared to comfort the kender, it didn't do a lot for the confidence of the half-elf. Somehow, Danis muttered, that has me worried. So did the expression on the kender's face. Tass, Tannis assumed his sternest air, promise me that you'll keep out of mischief. Do you promise? Of course I promise, Tannis. Tass said, with an expression of such sincere innocence that the half-elf groaned. But there was nothing he could do about it now. Caramon was already reciting the magical chant and manipulating the device. The last glimpse Tannis had, before he vanished into the swirling mists of magic, was of Tasselhoff waving goodbye with a cheerful smile and one hand hidden behind his back. As soon as he was alone, Tasselhoff brought his hand forward. In it was Tannis's magical bracelet. He'd stolen it again. The Kender ran through the burning streets of Polanthus's old city until he found Tannis's dragon, Fireflash. The bronze dragon was in danger of losing a battle to the death with a black dragon that was twice its size. Tass saved Fireflash's life by using the bracelet, fighting off the evil dragon's magic till another bronze dragon could come to the rescue. In gratitude... Fireflash flew the Kender up to the Flying Citadel. Then the Bronze Dragon went off to do battle with Kitiara's giant blue dragon, Sky, who had just deposited her at the edge of the Shoikan Grove. Inside the Citadel, Tass found the place mostly empty. Its occupants were down on the ground attacking the city. After exploring for a while, Tass came out onto a balcony and saw Tannis and Karaman on a balcony just a few flights below him. They were backed up against a locked door, holding off twenty or so draconians. Soon, a black-robed magic user joined the battle. Tannis reached for his magic-resistant silver bracelet, only to find that it was gone. The Kender called out to him and threw the bracelet down so Tannis could hold off the magic spells. Then the Kender ran downstairs to unlock the door. On the way down, he met a gully dwarf named Rounce, who showed him where the door was and gave him the key. Tass opened the door, letting Tannis and Karaman in. Then he locked the door behind them, which held off the draconians for the moment. Rounce told them that the steering mechanism for the entire citadel was at the top of the middle tower. The pilot, whom Rounce called the Wind Captain, was the black-robed magic user Tannis and Karaman had just been battling with. Suddenly the draconians burst through the door. Tannis and Karaman held them off while Rounce guided Tass to the Wind Captain's station and together they managed to set the citadel in motion and steer it toward the Tower of High Sorcery. The movement of the citadel threw the draconians below into confusion. Caramon was able to kill the wind captain, and the rest ran every which way, leaving Caramon and Tannis to themselves. As the citadel flew over the Shoikan Grove, approaching the Dark Tower itself, Caramon filled Tannis in on everything that had happened. The half-elf listened in amazement. It's hard to believe, Caramon, even of Raceland. I know. I didn't want to believe it. Not for a long time. 
but when I saw him standing before the portal, and when I heard him tell what he was going to do to Crisania, I knew that the evil had finally eaten into his soul. You're right, Caramon. You must stop him. But does that mean you have to go into the abyss after him? Dalamar is in the tower, waiting at the portal. Surely the two of you together can prevent Raceland from coming through. You don't need to enter the portal yourself. No, Tennis. Remember, Dalamar failed to stop Raceland the first time. Something must be going to happen to the Dark Elf. Something that will prevent him from fulfilling his assignment. Reaching into his knapsack, Caramon pulled out the chronicles. Turning to the page he had marked, Caramon scanned it hurriedly, then drew in his breath with a soft whistle. What is it? Tanis asked, leaning over to see. Caramon hastily shut the book. Something happens to him, all right. Kittyara kills him. Dalimar sat alone in the laboratory of the Tower of High Sorcery, watching out the window as Palanthus burned. He saw the Citadel flying toward the tower, and thinking it was Kittyara approaching, dispatched the guardians to guard the stairs leading down from the roof. On his hand, he wore a ring of healing. It could heal a mortal wound, but its power could only be used once. Dalimar glanced at the portal. The eyes of the five dragon heads were beginning to glow. I am ready, Dalimar told himself. Powerful magic surrounds me. I am skilled in the art, and though not as skilled as he, the Shalafi will come through that portal injured, weak, upon the point of death. It will be easy to destroy him. Then why am I suffocating with fear? A silver bell sounded once. Startled, Dalimar rose from the chair, his body tensing. The silver bell meant an intruder. Someone had won his way through the Shoikan Grove and was at the tower entrance. Ordinarily, Dalimar would have left the laboratory instantly on the words of a spell to confront the intruder himself. But he dared not leave the portal. He must trust to the guardians. He heard faint sounds down below, a muffled cry, a clash of steel, then silence. He waited, holding his breath, hearing only the beating of his own heart. Nothing else. Dalimar sighed. The guardians must have handled the matter. Looking out the window, he could see nothing. The smoke was as thick as fog. He heard a distant rumble of thunder, or perhaps it was an explosion. Who had it been down there? A draconian, perhaps, eager for more killing? Not that it mattered. When all this was over, he would go down, examine the corpse. Dalimar! Dalimar's heart leaped, both fear and hope surging through him at the sound of Kittyara's voice. Caution. Caution, he whispered to himself. She betrayed her brother. She betrayed you. Do not trust her. Yet he found his hand shaking as he slowly crossed the laboratory toward the door. Delamar! Kittyara called again, her voice quivering with pain and terror. There was a thud against the door, the sound of a body sliding down it. Behind Delamar, the dragon's eyes glowed red, white, blue, green, black. Delamar! Kittyara murmured faintly. I've come to help you. Slowly, Dalimar opened the laboratory door. Kittyara lay on the floor at his feet. The garment she wore beneath her armor was ripped to shreds, exposing her tanned skin. Blood oozed from a ghastly wound upon one leg. Yet, she looked up at him with eyes that were not afraid. In her hand, she held the night jewel, the charm Raceland had given her to protect her in the grove. I was strong enough, barely, she whispered her lips parting in the crooked smile that made Dalimar's blood burn. She raised her arms. I've come to you. Help me stand. Reaching down, Dalimar lifted Kittyara to her feet. She slumped against him. His arm around her, he half carried her into the laboratory and shut the door behind them. She leaned her head against his chest. He could smell the fragrance of her hair, that strange smell, a mixture of perfume and steel. Opening her eyes, she looked up into his. I'm feeling better now, she whispered. Her hand slid down. Too late, Dalimar saw the brown eyes glitter. Too late, he saw the crooked smile twist. Too late, he felt her hand jerk and the quick stabbing thrust of pain as her knife entered his body. Well, we made it. 
Caramon yelled, staring down from the courtyard of the Flying Citadel as it floated above the dark trees of the Shoikin Grove. Yes, at least this far. Nice, cheerful place, Tannis muttered, staring at the balcony that encircled the top of the dark tower. You know, of course, Caramon, there's every possibility Tasselhoff is going to crash right into that thing. We've come this far, Tannis. The gods are with us. Tannis grinned. That doesn't sound like the old Caramon. That Caramon's dead, Tannis. Parsalian told me, when he sent me back in time, that I was going back to save a soul. Nothing more, nothing less. I thought he meant Raceland's soul. I see now that he meant my own. Come on, we're close enough to jump for it. The balcony appeared beneath them, dimly seen through the swirling smoke. Looking down, Tannis felt his stomach shrivel. Jump! shouted Garamon, hurling himself into space. Tannis jumped, landing with a jarring thud that left him stunned and breathless. Caramon was on his feet, roaring, North, Tass! Due north! The flying citadel drifted off on its new northerly tack, heading straight for the palace of Lord Amathus. You all right, Tannis? Yeah, I bit my tongue. Damn, that hurts. The only way down is over here, Tannis. Caramon led the way to an archway carved into the black stone of the tower. A small wooden door stood closed and barred. There'll probably be guards, Tannis pointed out as Caramon prepared to hurl his weight against the door. Yeah. Making a short run, Caramon threw himself into the door. It gave with a shattering boom, carrying Caramon with it. Hurrying inside, Tannis found Caramon on the floor. The half-elf started to reach a hand down to his friend when he stopped, staring. Name of the abyss! Two pairs of disembodied eyes floated before them, barring the way to the door that led inside. Hurriedly, Caramon got to his feet. Yeah, I've run into these before. Don't let them touch you, Tannis. They drain the life from your body. The eyes floated nearer. Hurriedly, Caramon stepped in front of Tannis, facing the eyes. I'm Caramon Magier, brother of Fist and Dantilis. You know me. You have seen me before, in times long past. The eyes halted. Tannis lifted his arm. The cold light of the guardian's eyes was reflected in the silver bracelet. I am a friend of your master, Dalimar, he said, trying to keep his voice firm. He gave me this bracelet. Tannis felt suddenly a cold grip on his arm. He gasped in pain that seemed to bore straight to his heart. The bracelet's gone, he said. Dalimar, Caramon yelled. Dalimar, it's Caramon, Reisland's brother. I've got to get into the portal. I can stop him. Call off the guardians, Dalimar. Perhaps it's too late, Tannis said, staring at the pallid eyes. Maybe Kit got here first. Maybe he's dead. Then so are we, Caramon said softly. Damn you, Kit Yara, Dalimar staggered backward, pressing his hand against his side, feeling his blood flow through his fingers. On Kit Yara's face was a look of fear for she saw that the stroke that should have killed had missed. Why? she asked herself in fury. She had slain a hundred men this way. Why should she miss now? Dropping her knife, she drew her sword, lunging forward. The sword whistled with the force of her stroke, but it struck an invisible wall. Sparks crackled as the metal hit the magical shield Dalimar had conjured up around him, and a paralyzing shock sizzled from the blade running up her arm. The defensive spells Dalimar had cast had been reflexive, a result of years of training. Don't make me kill you, Kitiara! Dalimar edged his way nearer the stone desk, where lay his magical wand. His timing must be precise. He would have to dispel the magical shield to use the wand against Kit. And he saw in Kitiara's eyes that she knew this. She was waiting for him to drop the shield, biding her time. You have been deceived, Kitiara! By you, Dalimar! Lifting a silver candle stand, she hurled it at Dalimar. It bounced harmlessly off the magical shield. By Lord Soth, Kitiara! Ha! Kitiara hurled a glass beaker against the magical shield. It broke into a thousand glittering shards. Another candle stand followed. Kitiara had fought magic users before. She knew how to defeat them. Her missiles were not intended to hurt, only to weaken the mage, force him to spend his strength maintaining the shield, make him think twice about lowering it. Why do you suppose you found Palantis fortified? Dalimar continued. Had you expected that? Soth told me your plans. He told me you were going to attack Palanthus to try to help your brother. Kitiara's sword lowered an inch. Soth told you that? 
Yes? Delamar sensed her hesitation and confusion. He ventured a glance down at his wound. His robes had stuck to it, forming a crude bandage. The bleeding had almost stopped. Why would Soth betray me to you, Dark Elf? Because he wants you, Kitiara. He wants you the only way he can have you. Cold terror pierced Kitiara's very soul. She remembered that odd edge in Soth's hollow voice. She remembered it was he who had advised her to attack Balanthus. Her rage seeping from her, Kitiara shuddered, convulsed with chills. The wounds are poison, she realized bitterly, seeing the long scratches the guardians had made upon her arms and legs. Keeping an eye on her, Delamar moved nearer to the wand he needed. Kitiara let her shoulders slump, her head droop. Feigning to be seriously hurt, all the while, she felt strength returning to her numb sword arm. Let him think he has won. I'll hear his attack. At the first magical word he utters, I'll slice him in two. Her hand tightened on the sword hilt. She would deal with Soth later. What Dalamar said about Raislin intrigued her more. Could he perhaps win? Would he bring the Dark Queen into this plane? The thought appalled Kitiara. As for my sniveling worm of a brother, you're the one who means to help him when he comes through the portal, Dalamar. No, dear lover. I do not trust you. Dalamar saw Kitiara shiver. She was weakening, certainly. Her face had paled when he mentioned Soth. Surely she must realize she had been betrayed. She must now see her great folly. Still, he dared not trust her. Grasping the wand, he spoke the word of magic that diffused the magical shield guarding him. At that instant, Kitiara whirled around. Her sword grasped in both hands, she wielded it with all her strength. The blow would have severed Dalamar's head had he not twisted his body to use the wand. As it was, the blade caught him across the right shoulder, plunging deep into his flesh. He dropped the wand with a scream, but not before it had unleashed its magical power. Lightning forked, its sizzling blast striking Kitiara in the chest, slamming her to the floor. Dalamar slumped over the table, blood spurted rhythmically from his arm. He knew he would be dead in minutes. The ring of healing was on his right hand, his injured arm. Reaching across with his left, he grasped the ring and spoke the magical word. Then he lost consciousness, his body slipping to the floor to lie in a pool of his own blood. Delamar! A voice called his name. Drowsily, the dark elf stirred. Pain shot through his body. His right arm hung useless at his side, but at least the ring had stopped the bleeding. He would live, but would it be only to die at the hands of the Shalafi? Dalamar! It's Caramon! Dalamar sobbed in relief. Fighting the pain, the dark elf forced himself to consciousness, wondering why Caramon didn't come. What was the matter? And then Dalamar remembered. The guardians. Of course, they would never let him pass. Guardians, hear my words and obey. Dalamar began, concentrating his thoughts and energies murmuring the words that would help Caramon pass the dread defenders of the tower and enter the chamber. Behind Dalimar, the dragon's heads glowed brighter yet, while before him, in the shadowed corner, a hand reached into a blood-drenched belt and with its last strength gripped the handle of a dagger. Dalimar! Caramon called again. Dalimar! I... As suddenly as if they had been snuffed out, the glowing eyes that had barred their way vanished. They're gone, said Caramon, starting forward eagerly. Come on, Tannis! Caramon started down the winding stairs at a run. Two stories down, the door to the laboratory stood open. Inside, light shone brightly, beaming into the corridor. Caramon dashed ahead, and Tannis followed, slamming the door shut behind him. Caramon hurried forward to kneel beside a figure huddled in a pool of blood upon the floor. Dalimar, Tannis registered, seeing the black robes. The evil in the darkness outside the door had been smothering dusty, centuries old. But the evil in here was alive. It breathed and throbbed and pulsed. Tannis looked into beakers and saw tormented eyes staring back at him. He choked on the smells of spices and mold and fungus and roses and somewhere the smell of burned flesh. And then his gaze was caught by glowing light radiating from a corner. The light reminded him vividly of his encounter with the Dark Queen. It seemed to be of every color he had ever seen whirling into one. But as he watched, 
he saw the light separate and become distinct, forming into the five heads of a dragon. The five heads rose, forming an oval shape with their necks, each craned inward, its mouth open in a frozen scream. Tanis looked beyond them, into the void within. Nothing was there, but that nothingness moved. All was empty and alive. The portal, said Caramon. Come here, Tanis, give me a hand. You're going in there? Caramon, don't be a fool. I have no choice, Tanis. I've seen what will happen. Swallowing his words, Tanis knelt down beside Dalimar. The dark elf had managed to drag himself to a sitting position so that he could face the portal. Caramon, he gasped, reaching out a trembling hand. You must stop. I know what I must do, but I need your help, Dalimar. Tell me... Dalimar's eyes fluttered shut. His skin was ashen. Tanis reached across Dalimar's chest to feel for the life bead in his neck. Just as he touched it, there was a ringing sound. Something jarred his arm, striking the armor and bouncing off, falling to the floor with a clatter. Looking down, Tanis saw a dagger. Startled, he whirled around, sword in hand. Kitiara, Dalimar whispered with a feeble nod of his head. Staring into the shadows, Tanis saw the body in the corner. Of course, Garamond murmured. That's how she killed Dalimar. This time, Tanis, you blocked her throw. You saved him. But Tanis didn't hear. Sliding his sword back into his sheath, he crossed the room. Kitty R lay on her stomach, her cheek pressed against the bloody floor, her dark hair falling across her eyes. The dagger throw had taken her last energy, it seemed. Tanis was certain she must be dead. But the indomitable will that had carried one brother through darkness and another into light burned still within Kitiara. Her hand grasped feebly for her sword. She raised her head, looking up with eyes fast dimming. Tanis. She stared at him, puzzled, confused. Smiling, she raised her hand to him. As she moved, Tanis saw a blackened hole gaping in her chest. Her flesh had been burned away, and he could see white bone beneath. It was a gruesome sight, and Tanis, sickened and overwhelmed by a surge of memories, was forced to turn away. Tanis, come to me. His heart filled with pity. Tanis knelt down beside her to lift her in his arms. She looked up into his face and saw her death in his eyes. I'm hurt. How bad. Rest easy, kid. You'll be all right. <laughs> You're a damn liar. He's killed me, that wretched elf. But I fixed him. He can't help Raceland now. The Dark Queen will slay him, slay them all. She looked up at him. Tannis, you weakling. We could have had the world, you and I. I have the world, Kitiara, Tannis said, his heart torn with revulsion and sorrow. Kit seemed about to say more when her eyes grew wide, her gaze fixed upon something at the far end of the room. No, no, don't let him take me. Tannis, keep him away. I always loved you, half-elf. Always loved you. Tannis looked up, alarmed. But the doorway was empty. There was no one there. Had she met Dalimar? Who, Kitiara? I don't understand. But her ears were deaf forever to mortal voices. The only voice she heard now was one she would hear forever, through all eternity. Tannis felt the body in his arms go limp. Smoothing back the dark, curly hair, he searched her face for some sign that death had brought peace to her soul. But the expression on her face was one of horror, the crooked, charming smile twisted into a grimace. Tannis glanced up at Caramon. His face pale and grave, the big man shook his head. Pulling his cloak up over Kitiara's head, Tanis remained for a moment. Then he heard Caramon's step. He felt a hand upon his arm. Tanis, I'm all right. The half-elf rose to his feet. But in his mind, he could still hear her dying plea. Keep him away. It was time for Caramon to enter the portal. He knew from Astinus's book that Raistlin had left the portal open to make sure of his escape route before he went into battle. 
He also knew that the Dark Queen's only way into this world was to follow someone else through the portal. Even if he succeeded in killing Raistlin, Caramon knew that he would die himself, unable to return through the portal, lest the Queen follow. Caramon asked Tannis to say goodbye to Tika for him. Then, with a wave to Tannis and Dalimar, who was lying propped up on a pillow, Caramon stepped through the portal and into the abyss. At first they could still see him through it, as though he were very far away. Then Lord Soth arrived in the laboratory to take Kitiara away with him. It was painful for Tannis to let the inevitable happen, but in the end there was nothing he could do. From the other side of the portal Caramon could see Tannis and Dalamar, although just barely. Turning, he spotted Lady Crisania. She was dying, although he could not see her wounds. He could, however, see that she was blind and in despair, having finally realized her folly in helping Raistlin. Caramon thought if he could get her back through the portal, the clerics of Paladine might be able to help her recover. But if he took the time to bring her back, he knew he might lose his only chance to stop Raistlin and save the world from destruction. Perhaps if he could hand her through it to Tannis. But before Caramon could decide, he saw Raistlin coming. Ahead of him, the portal. Behind him, the queen. Behind him, pain. Ahead of him, victory. Leaning upon the staff of Magius, so weak he could barely stand, Raceland kept the image of the portal ever in his mind. It seemed he had stumbled mile after endless mile to reach it. Now he was close. His wounds were too numerous to count. He had been attacked by dark clerics, dark wizards, legions of ghouls and demons, all who served her dark majesty. And through it all he had endured. Exultation ran like fever through his veins. He had survived. He lived. Just barely, but he lived. The Queen's fury thrummed behind him. He could feel the ground and sky pulsate with it. There were none left now to challenge him, none except herself. The portal shimmered with myriad colors in his hourglass vision. Closer, closer he came. Behind him, the Queen. He would escape the abyss. She could not stop him now. A shadow crossed over him. Looking up, he saw the fingers of a gigantic hand darkening the sky, the nails glistening blood red. Raceland kept advancing. It was a shadow, nothing more. He was too close, and she was too far away. Her hand would grasp the skirts of his tattered black robes when he crossed over the threshold of the portal, and, with his last strength, he would drag her through the door, and then, upon his plane, who would prove the stronger? Raceland had no doubts. The gods themselves would answer his call, for the queen, appearing in the world in all her might and majesty, would bring down the wrath of the heavens. Moons would fall, planets shift in their orbits, stars change their courses. The elements would do his bidding, wind, air, water, fire, all under his command. And now, ahead of him, the portal, the dragon's heads shrieking in impotent fury, knowing they lacked the power to stop him. Just one more step. He lifted his hooded head and stopped. A figure, unseen before, rose up before him, a gleaming sword in its hand. Raceland stared for a moment. Then joy surged through his shattered body. Caramon! His twin was here, as he had ever been here, waiting to fight at his side. Caramon! Help me, my brother. Come to me. I cannot walk alone. But Caramon just stood there, his sword in his hand, staring at him with eyes of mingled love and a deep burning sorrow that exposed Raceland's barren, empty soul. And then Raceland knew. He knew why his twin was here. You fool. You will die. Caramon drew a deep breath. Yes, and so will you. The sky above them darkened. Raceland could feel a vast flaming heat behind him, the rage of his queen. Fear twisted his bowels, anger wrenched his stomach. The words of magic surged up. He started to hurl them at his twin, but he choked and sank to his knees, coughing. If only he could catch his breath. Finally the spasm passed, and Raceland looked up, ready to cast the spell that would end his brother's life. Caramon stood before him, his sword in his hand, staring at him with pity in his eyes. Pity! The look slammed into Raceland with the force of a hundred swords. Yes, his twin would die, but not with that look upon his face. Caramon, I want you to die with the knowledge that I am going into the world to become a god. I know, Raceland. The pity did not fade from his eyes. It only deepened. And that is why I pity you, for I have seen the future. 
I know the outcome. Raceland stared at his brother, suspecting some trick. You have seen the future. How? When you went through the portal raced, the magical field affected the device, throwing Tass and me into the future. Raceland devoured his brother eagerly with his eyes. And? What will happen? You will be victorious. Not only over the Queen of Darkness, but over all the gods. Your constellation alone will shine in the skies. For a time. For a time! Tell me! What happens? Who deposes me? You do. You rule over a dead world, Raislin. You are alone in those heavens. You try to create, but there's nothing left within you to draw upon. So you suck life from the stars themselves until they finally burst and die. And then there is nothing around you, nothing inside you. No! You lie! Damn you, you lie! Hurling the staff of mages from him, Raislin lurched forward, clawing at his brother. Startled, Caramon raised his sword, but it fell to the ground at a word from Raislin. Reaching up, Raislin pressed his burning, blood-stained hand upon his brother's forehead, dragging Caramon's visions from his mind into his own. And Raislin saw. He saw the bones of the world, the rotting bodies of the dead. He saw himself in the cold void, emptiness around him, emptiness within. Raislin's head slumped. His hand slipped from his brother's forehead, clenching in pain. He knew this would come to pass. Knew it because the emptiness was already there. It had been there within him for so long now. Oh, it had not consumed him utterly. Not yet. But he could see his soul, frightened, lonely, crouched in an empty corner. With a bitter cry, Raceland shoved his brother away from him. He looked around. The shadows deepened. His queen was gathering her strength. He fell to his knees, trying to kindle the burning flame of his magic. But even that was dying. Fear shook him. He sought for help, stretching out his hand. He heard a moan. His hand closed over white cloth. He felt warm flesh. Poo-poo! The body of the gully dwarf lay before him. Her face pinched and starved, her eyes wide with terror. Wretched, terrified, she shrank away from him. Poo-poo! Don't you remember me? You gave me a book once. A book and an emerald. He fished the shining green stone out of one of his pockets. Here, Poo-poo. Take it, keep it, it will protect you. She reached for it, but as she did, her fingers stiffened in death. No, Raceland cried, and felt Caramon's hand upon his arm. Leave her alone, Raceland. Haven't you done enough to her already? Caramon held his sword in his hand once more. Raceland turned away and saw not Boo-Poo, but Chrysania, her skin blackened and blistered, her eyes staring at him without seeing him. Empty. Nothing within him? Yes, something there. His soul stretched forth its hand. His own hand reached out, touched Grisania's blistered skin. She's not dead. Not yet, he said. Caramon raised his sword. Leave her alone. Let her at least die in peace. She will live, Caramon, if you take her through the portal. Yes, she will live, and so will you. I take her through the portal, and you come right after us. Caramon stepped toward his twin, his sword ready. Raceland raised his hand. Caramon suddenly couldn't move. His sword hung suspended in the air. Take her, Caramon. Take her, and take this as well. Raceland's frail hand closed around the staff of Medius that lay at his side. The light from its crystal glowed clear and strong in the deepening darkness, shedding its magical glow over them. Lifting the staff, Raceland held it out to his twin. Caramon hesitated, his brow furrowing. Take it, my brother. Take it. Take it and her and yourself back through the portal. Use the staff to close it behind you. No, I'm not lying, my brother. I've lied to you before, but not now. Try it. See for yourself. Look, I release you from the enchantment. I cannot cast another spell. If you find I am lying, you may slay me. I will not be able to stop you. Caramon's sword arm was freed. He reached out his other hand hesitantly. His fingers touched the staff, and he looked fearfully at the light in the crystal, expecting it to blink out and leave them all in the gathering, chilling darkness. But the light did not waver. Caramon took the staff. Hurry, my brother. I will keep the queen from following you. 
but my strength will not last long. Garamon sheathed his sword. What will happen to you? He asked as he knelt down to lift up Crisani in his arms. You fool! What do you care what becomes of me? Get out! Wasteland's strength was dwindling very fast. His vision dimmed. But in Caramon's eyes, he thought he saw understanding. Goodbye, my brother, Caramon said. Holding Crisani in his arms, the staff of mages in one hand, Caramon turned and stepped through the portal. Wasteland, watching him with his soul, caught a blurred glimpse of colors and life and felt a brief whisper of warmth touch his sunken cheek. Behind him, he could hear the mocking laughter gurgle into harsh, hissing breath. He could hear the slithering sounds of a gigantic scaled tail, the creaking of wing tendons. Behind him, five heads whispered words of torment and terror. Steadfastly, Raceland stood, staring into the portal. He saw Tannis run to help Caramon. He saw him take Crisani in his arms. Tears blurred Raceland's vision. He wanted to follow. He wanted Tannis to touch his hand. He wanted to hold Crisani in his arms. He took a step forward. He saw Caramon turn to face him, the staff in his hand. Caramon stared into the portal, stared at his twin, stared beyond his twin. Raceland saw his brother's eyes grow wide with fright. Raceland did not have to turn to know what his brother saw. The Queen of Darkness crouched behind him. He could feel the chill of the loathsome reptile body flow about him, fluttering his robes. Yet her thoughts were not on him. She saw her way to the world, standing open. Shut it! Raceland screamed. A blast of flame seared Raceland's flesh. A taloned claw stabbed him in the back. He stumbled, falling to his knees. But he never took his eyes from the portal, and he saw Caramon take a step forward toward him. Shut it, you fool! Leave me alone! I don't need you anymore! I don't need you! And then the light was gone. The portal slammed shut, and blackness pounced upon him with raging fury. Talons ripped his flesh, teeth tore through muscle and crunched bone. Blood flowed from his breast, but it would not take with it his life. He screamed, and he would scream, and he would keep on screaming unendingly. Tannis could stand the waiting no longer. Caramon had drifted out of sight of the portal, and utter silence reigned in the laboratory as he and Dalimar waited. Walking across the room, Tannis glanced out the window at the sky. The dragons had vanished from sight, both good and evil. He listened. No sound came from the city beneath him. The battle is over, he realized numbly. It has ended, and we have won. Victory, hollow, wretched victory. And then, a flutter of bright blue caught his eye. Looking out over the city, Tannis gasped. The flying citadel had suddenly drifted into view. Dropping down from the storm clouds, it was careening along merrily, having somewhere acquired a brilliant blue banner that streamed out in the wind. The banner and the minaret attached to it had once been part of the palace of Lord Amathus. Leaning against the window, Tannis continued watching the citadel, which had also acquired a bronze dragon as honor guard. He felt his bleakness and grief and fear ease, and the tension in his body relax. No matter what happened in the world or on the plains beyond, some things, Kender among them, never changed. Tannis watched as the flying castle wobbled out over the bay. Then he was startled to see the citadel suddenly flip over and hang in the air upside down. What is Tass doing? he muttered. And then he knew. The citadel began to bob up and down rapidly like a salt shaker. Black shapes with leathery wings tumbled out of the windows and from doorways. Up and down, up and down bobbed the citadel, more and more black shapes dropping out. Tannis grinned. When no more draconians could be seen spilling out into the water, the citadel righted itself again and continued on its way, vanishing into the clouds. Smiling, Tannis turned to see Dalimar gesture toward the portal. There he is. Caramon has returned to his position. Swiftly, the half-elf crossed the room and stood before the portal once again. He could see Caramon, still a tiny figure in gleaming armor. This time, he carried someone in his arms. Raceland? Tannis asked, puzzled. Lady Crisania. Now Caramon must make a difficult choice. What do you mean, Dalimar? 
He could save her by bringing her back to the portal himself, which would leave us all at the mercy of either his brother or the queen or both. Tanis was silent, watching. Caramon was drawing closer and closer to the portal, Crisani in his arms. Ah, it seems his choice has been made for him, Dalimar said, relief mixed with fear in his voice. Looking into the portal, Tanis saw Raislin. He saw the final meeting between the twins. Caramon brought Lady Crisani through the portal. Running forward to help him, Tanis took Crisani in his arms. Stay with her, Tanis, Caramon said. I must close the portal. Do it quickly, Tanis heard Dalimar sharp and take a breath. He saw the dark elf staring into the portal in horror. Tanis halted, mesmerized by the sight before his eyes. A shadow of evil filled the portal. The metallic dragon's heads howled in triumph. The living dragon's heads beyond the portal writhed above their victim as the archmage fell to their claws. No! Kermon's face twisted in anguish. He took a step toward the portal. Stop! Dalimar screamed in fury. Stop him, Hafelvin! Kill him if you must! Close the portal! A woman's hand lunged for the opening, and as they watched in stunned terror, the hand became a dragon's claw, the nails tipped with red, the talons stained with blood. Nearer and nearer the portal, the hand of the queen came, intent upon keeping this door to the world open so that she could gain entry. Caramon! Tanis cried, springing forward. But what could he do? He was not strong enough to physically overpower the big man. He'll go to him, Tanis thought in agony. He will not let his brother die. No, spoke a voice inside the half-elf. He will not. And therein lies the salvation of the world. Caramon stopped, held fast by the power of that blood-stained hand. Slowly, struggling against the evil force, Caramon raised the staff of Magius. Nothing happened. The dragon's heads of the oval doorway split the air with their trumpeting, hailing the entry of their queen into the world. Then, a shadowy apparition appeared standing beside Caramon, dressed in black robes, white hair flowing down upon his shoulders. Raislin raised a golden-skinned hand and, reaching out, gripped the staff of Magius, his hand resting near his twins. The staff flared with a pure silver light. The portal closed. The metallic dragon's head ceased their screaming. Within the portal, there was neither movement nor stillness, neither darkness nor nor light. Caramon stood before the portal alone, the staff of Magius in his hand. The light of the crystal glimmered, then died, and there came to the darkness a whispering voice. Farewell, my brother. It was only two days after the end of what Astinus referred to in the Chronicles as the test of the twins. The city of Palanthus was in ruins. The only two buildings left standing were the Tower of High Sorcery and the Great Library. The Temple of Paladine, like the rest of the city, was now nothing more than memory and a few words of description in Astinus's books. Many had died in the heroic defense of the city. Sir Markham, along with most of the knights, were killed in the onslaught of Lord Soth's skeletal warriors, who had departed abruptly when their leader appeared bearing Kittyara's corpse. Kittyara's death had set her draconian troops to flight as well. Estinus recorded it all as it was occurring. He wrote continuously until one of the servants came in and announced Caramon and Tasselhoff. Tasselhoff Burfoot, said the kender, presenting a small hand to Estinus, who shook it gravely. And you're Estinus of Palanthus. I've met you before, but you don't remember because it hasn't happened yet. Or rather, uh, well, come to think of it, it never will happen, will it, Caramon? No, Tess. Astinus turned his gaze to Caramon, regarding him intently. You do not resemble your twin. But then Raceland had undergone many trials that marked him both physically and mentally. Still, there is something of him in your eyes. The historian frowned, puzzled. There's a mystery about you, Caramon Magier, and there are no mysteries for me. I know everything that transpires upon the face of Kryn. I know the thoughts of every living being. I see their actions. I read the wishes of their hearts. 
yet I cannot read your eyes. Taz told you. Reaching into a knapsack he wore, the big man produced a huge leather-bound volume, which he set carefully down upon the desk in front of the historian. That's one of mine! Estinus glanced at the book, his frown deepening. Where did it come from? None of my books leave without my knowledge. Look at the date. Estinus glared furiously at Caramon for a second, then shifted his angry gaze to the book. He stared at the date, his eyes widening. Sinking down into his chair, he looked from the volume to Caramon, then back to the volume again. It is the future I see in your eyes. The future that is in this book, Caramon said. We were there, said Tass, bouncing up eagerly. Would you like to hear about it? It's the most wonderful story. You see, we came back to Solace, only it didn't look like Solace. It... Hush, Tass, Caramon said gently. Standing up, he put his hand on the gander's shoulder and quietly left the room. Tass glanced backward. Goodbye. Nice seeing you again. Uh, uh, before, uh, after, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> but Astinus did not notice. The day he received the book from Caramon Magere was the only day that passed in the entire history of Crin that had nothing recorded for it but one entry. This day, as above after watch rising fourteen, Caramon Magere brought me the Chronicles of Crin, volume two thousand, a volume written by me that I will never write. The funeral of Elistan represented to the people of Palanthus the funeral of their beloved city as well. The ceremony was held at daybreak, as Elistan had requested, and everyone in Palanthus attended, old, young, rich, poor. The injured who were able to be moved were carried from their homes, their pallets laid upon the scorched and blackened grass of the once beautiful lawns of the temple. Among these was Dalamar. The people settled down on the lawn in silence, the birds, knowing nothing of death or war or grief, but knowing only that the sun was rising and that they were alive in the bright morning, filled the air with song. The sun's rays tipped the mountains with gold, driving away the darkness of the night, bringing light to hearts heavy with sorrow. One person rose to speak Alistair's eulogy, and it was deemed fitting by everyone that she do so. Not only because she was now taking his place, as he had requested, as head of the church, but because she seemed to the people of Palanthus to epitomize their loss and their pain. She had been near death herself, but her faith and the prayers of the clerics restored her to life. They could not, however, restore her sight. Chrysania stood before them that morning, her eyes looking straight into the sun she would never see again. Its rays glistened in her black hair that framed a face made beautiful by a look of deep, abiding compassion and faith. We have come through these trials with great loss, with great sacrifice, but strong in the knowledge that our spirit shines and that we, perhaps, gleam brightest among all the stars of the heavens. For though some might choose to walk the paths of night, looking to the black moon to guide them, while others walk the paths of day, the rough and rock-strewn trails of both can be made easier by the touch of a hand voice of a friend. The capacity to love, to care, is given to us all, the greatest gift of the gods to all the races. Our beautiful city has perished in flame. We've lost many whom we loved, and it seems perhaps that life is too difficult to bear. But reach out your hand, and it will touch the hand of someone reaching out to you. And together, you will find the strength and hope you need to go on. After the ceremonies, when the clerics had borne the body of Elistan to its final resting place, Caramon and Tass sought out Lady Crisania. They found her among the clerics, her arm resting upon the arm of the young woman who was her guide. Here are two who would speak with you, revered daughter. It's me, Caramon, and... And me, Tasselhoff. 
You have come to say goodbye, Lady Crescenia smiled. Yes, we're leaving today, Caramon said, holding her hand. Do you go straight home to Solace? No, not, um, not quite yet. We're going back to Salanthus with Tanis. Then, when I feel a little more myself, I'll use the magical device to get back to Solace. Crescenia gripped his hand tightly, drawing him near to her. Raceland is at peace, Caramon. Are you? Yes, my lady. I am at peace. At last. I just need to talk to Tannis, get things sorted out in my life, put back in order. For one thing, I need to know how to build a house. I was dead drunk most of the time I worked on ours. I haven't the faintest notion what I was doing. He looked at her, and, aware of his scrutiny, though she could not see it, she smiled, her pale skin tinged with the faintest rose. Seeing that smile and seeing the tears that fell around it, Caramon drew her close in turn. I'm sorry. I wish I could have spared you this. No, Caramon. For now I see clearly. Farewell, Caramon. May Paladine go with you. Tasselhoff snuffled. Good goodbye, Crisania. I mean, revered daughter. I'm, I'm sorry about the mess I, ma I made of things. But Lady Crisani interrupted him. Most of us walk in the light and the shadow, Tasselhoff. But there are the chosen few who walk this world, carrying their own light to brighten both day and night. You are someone like that. Farewell, Tasselhoff Burfoot. I need not ask Paladine's blessing on you, for I know you are one of his close, personal friends. Well, asked Caramon abruptly, as he and Tass made their way through the crowd, have you decided what you're going to do yet? You got the flying citadel. Lord Amothus gave it to you. You can go anywhere on Kryn. Oh, I don't have the citadel anymore. It was awfully big and boring once I got around to exploring it. Now, if I had the magical device... He glanced up at Caramon. No, absolutely not. That's going back to Parsalian. I could take it to him. That would give me a chance to explain about my disrupting the spell and... No... I guess not. Well, anyway, I've decided to stick with you and Tannis, if you want me, that is. Caramon replied by reaching out and giving the Kendra a hug. By the way, Tess, what did you do with the Flying Citadel? Oh, I gave it to Rounce. The Gully Dwarf? Oh, he can't fly it, not by himself. Although I suppose he could get a few more Gully Dwarfs to help. I never thought of that. Anyway, Rounce took a liking to it, so I asked him if he wanted the Citadel, and he said he did, so I just plunked the thing down in this vacant lot. Fireflash brought me back. You didn't tell me any of this, Taz. I guess it just slipped my mind. I've had an awful lot to think about these days, you know. Well, I know you have, Taz. I've been worried about you. I saw you talking to some other Kinder yesterday. You could go home, you know. I know you've thought about going back to Kinder more. Taz slipped his hand into Caramon's. No, Caramon, it isn't the same. I can't seem to talk to other Kender anymore. They don't seem to understand. They just don't, well, care. It's hard. Caring, isn't it, Caramon? It hurts sometimes. Yes, Taz. They had entered a grove of trees. Tanis was waiting for them. It hurts a lot of the time. But the herd is better than being empty inside. Walking over to them, Tannis put one arm around Caramon's broad shoulders, the other arm around Tass. Ready? Ready, Caramon replied. Good. The horses are over here. I thought we'd ride. We could have taken the carriage, but to be perfectly honest, I hate being cooped up in the plastic thing. The countryside's beautiful this time of year. We'll take our time and enjoy it. You live in Salanthus, don't you, Tannis? Taz said as they mounted. I was in Salanthus once. They have an awfully fine prison there. One of the nicest I was ever in. I was sent there by mistake, of course. Oh, a misunderstanding over a silver teapot that had tumbled, quite by accident, into one of my pouches. Dalimar climbed the stairs to the laboratory. There was one more thing he had to do before leaving for the tower at Wayrith, where he would soon be named the new head of the Order of the Black Robes. Entering the laboratory, he walked over to the portal and lowered a thick black curtain in front of it. Then he turned and left the room, closing the door behind him. 
he took out a silver key inscribed with powerful runes and inserted it into an ornate door lock, a door lock that had not been made by any locksmith on Kryn. Whispering words of magic, Delamar turned the key in the lock. It clicked. Another click echoed it. The deadly trap was set. Turning, Dalimar summoned one of the guardians. Take this key and keep it with you for all eternity. Give it up to no one, not even myself. And from this moment on, your place is to guard this door. No one is to enter. Let death be swift for those who try. The guardian's eyes closed in acquiescence. As Dalimar walked back down the stairs, he saw the eyes framed by the doorway their cold glow staring out into the night. Satisfied, Dalimar went upon his way. Tika Whalen Majer sat straight up in bed. Trying to hear above the pounding of her heart, she listened, waiting to identify the sound that had awakened her from deep sleep. Tika's eyes opened wide. She hadn't been dreaming. The sound, whatever it was, was coming from up above. Someone or something was up there, up in the Valenwood tree. Throwing aside the bedclothes and moving with the stealth and quiet she had learned during her war adventures, Tika grabbed a nightrobe from the foot of her bed and crept out of the bedroom. Someone was up in her new house, the house Caramon had been building for her. What were they doing, stealing Caramon's tools? Weapon, she muttered. Looking around hastily, she grabbed the first thing she saw, her heavy iron skillet. Holding it firmly by the handle, Tika opened the front door. So fresh and glittering was this morning that it might well have been the very first morning of the very first day, with the gods looking down upon their work and smiling. But Tika was not thinking about gods or mornings or the cold dew on her bare feet. Clutching the skillet in one hand, hidden behind her back, she stealthily climbed the rungs of the ladder leading up into the unfinished house perched among the strong branches of the Valenwood. Aha! There was someone up here. She could just barely make out a figure crouched in the shadowy corner. Hauling herself up over the edge, still making no sound, Tika padded softly across the wooden floor, her fingers getting a firm grip on the skillet. It was a man, a big man. He was down on his hands and knees, his broad back was turned toward her. He was holding Caramon's hammer. How dare he! Well, big man or no, they're all the same size once they're laid out on the floor. Tika raised the skillet. Caravan, look out, cried a shrill voice. The big man rose to his feet and turned around. The skillet fell to the floor with a ringing clatter. So did a hammer and a handful of nails. With a thankful sob, Tika clasped her husband in her arms. <laughs> Isn't this wonderful, Tika? I bet you were surprised, weren't you? Weren't you surprised, Tika? Tass looked at his two friends. They weren't saying a word. They weren't hearing a word. They just stood there, holding each other. The Kender felt a suspicious moisture creep into his eyes. Well, I'll just uh, go down and wait for you in the living room. Slithering down the ladder, Tass entered the small, neat house that stood below the sheltering Valenwood. Once inside, he took out a handkerchief, blew his nose, then began to cheerfully sort out the contents of his pouches. Sitting down cross-legged on the floor, the kender blissfully upended them, spilling their contents out onto the rug. His gaze went first to a whole sheaf of new maps Tannis had given him. Unrolling them, one after another, his small finger traced a route to all the wonderful places he'd visited in his many adventures. It was nice traveling but it's certainly nicer coming home. I'll just stay here with Caramon and Tika. We'll be a family. Caramon said I could have a room in the new house, and... Why, what's that? He looked closely at the map. Marilon? I never heard of a city named Marilon. I wonder what it's like. No, you are through adventuring, Burfoot. Rolling up the map, he placed it back in its case and began to look through his other treasures. A white chicken feather, an emerald, a tiny golden dragon, a piece of broken blue crystal, dragon's tooth, white rose petals. Oh, that's all, I guess. Well, it certainly has been interesting. I met dragons, I flew in a citadel, I turned myself into a mouse, I broke a dragon orb, 
Paladine and I became close, personal friends. Oh, I'm going to miss adventuring very much. But there's no one to adventure with anymore. They've all settled down. Their lives are bright and pleasant. His small hand explored the bottom of one final pouch. It's time for me to settle down, too. Wait. What's that? In the very bottom... He pulled out a small object, staring at it in wonder. How did Caramon lose this? He was so very careful of it. I'll just go give it back to him. He's probably fearfully worried over misplacing it. Studying the plain, nondescript pendant, Tass never noticed that his other hand skittered around behind him and closed over the map case. Now, what was the name of that place, Marilon? It must have been the hand that spoke, certainly not Tass, who had given up adventuring. The map case went into a pouch, along with all of Tass's other treasures. The hand busily began to change the plain, nondescript pendant into a scepter that was really quite beautiful, all covered with jewels, and looked very magical. Once you're finished, Tass told his hand severely, we'll take it right upstairs and give it to Caramon. <laughs> Where's Taz Caramon? Went down to the house, I think. You realize we won't have a spoon left. Caramon smiled and kissed her lips. An hour later, the two were walking around the floor of the unfinished house. The baby's room will go here, Tika, next to our bedroom. And this will be the room for the older kids. In the kitchen and Taz's room and the guest room. Tannis and Lorana are coming to visit. And Caramon's voice died. He had come to the one room in the house he had actually finished. The room with the wizard's mark carved on a plaque which hung above the door. Reaching up, Caramon took down the plaque he'd carved for Raislin. He looked at it silently for long moments. Then, with a smile, handed it to Tika. Keep this for me, will you, my dear? Will you tell me what happened, Caramon? Someday. He gathered her into his arms. It doesn't matter anyway. I'm home. This has been a Random House Audiobooks presentation. Look for the complete trilogy of the Dragonlance Legends available on audio cassette from Random House.